Good evening. This is our 2021-22 budget hearing. Tonight, I am joined by, my, I'm sorry, my name is Kawita G. Adams, and I'm the superintendent for the City School District of Albany. And tonight, we are joined by Deputy Superintendent Kimberly Roaring, who will take us through the budget presentation and um, make sure that we are aware of what we are proposing, make sure that our community is aware of what we are proposing for the 21-22 school year. So at this time, I will turn the budget hearing over to Deputy Superintendent Kimberly Roaring. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Adams. So as always, when we started our budget development process this year, we reviewed our vision, mission, and goals to make sure that that was the core of what we would be reviewing and recommending to the board and the community. This year, we had the opportunity to establish a new budget commu community budget committee. Um, and one of the charges to the committee was to provide feedback to us in terms of the community's priorities. Some of those items were highest quality education um, possible, equity as a priority, focusing on student achievement and closing learning gaps, social emotional learning investments, as well as bringing back both Albany International Center and Tony, Center, Cle Tony Clement Center for Education as standalone programs. So what's in our proposed budget? It maintains all of our current staffing and programs. There's restoration of the building-based Albany International Center at 50 North Lark, restoration of the Tony, Senate, Tony Clement pardon me, Center for Education, grades nine through 12 at 395 Elk Street, moving our elementary sixth grade to middle school, moving the O'Neill eighth graders to North Albany Middle School, restoring ninth grade sports, additional social emotional supports for our students, as well as additional instructional intervention positions. This budget also supports full day pre-K, continues to support our magnet schools, as well as relocating the dual language program to begin expansion of that program, co-locating it with the Albany International Center. Community schools initiatives remain in seven of our schools, additional elementary music opportunities, uh, all of our college and career readiness programs at Albany High, as well as culturally relevant teaching and learning practices and restorative practices. So in our instructional planning for next year, our budget proposal in combination with federal COVID-19 relief aid allows the district to fully support all instructional models that would be permitted under COVID-19 social distancing requirements, which includes a full in-person model, in-person hybrid models, similar to our fourth quarter, and additional virtual option pending state ed approval. Here is our staffing ratios chart over time. When we look at the last column for the proposed budget for 21-22 and compare that to our adopted budget for 2021, we see that the numbers are nearly identical. Though we have lost our anticipating reduction of enrollment of almost 100 students, and then below the line, you'll see the staffing ratios by bargaining unit. Our state aid for next year based on the adopted budget includes a $14.1 million increase in foundation aid it's important to note that that restores a 4.5 million pandemic aid reduction adjustment that was made in 2021. So that is a $9.6 million increase over two years. It also shows increases in our charter school transition aid, excess cost aid, BOCES special service aid, and a significant reduction is anticipated in transportation aid. As a result of our different program models this year, our actual expenditures are not uh, anticipated to meet the budget. So when we look at our estimated revenue and expenditures for 21-22 pictorially, you'll see in the graph to the left the estimated revenue. Nearly 88% of that revenue comes from state aid other than building aid and property taxes. On the right hand side are the estimated expenditures. That blue area represents our instructional program which accounts for 80% of our budget. Looking at our program expenditures over the last three years, our program budget has increased or is proposed to increase by $8 million next year, which reflects a $6.4 million increase in our instructional program and $1.6 million increase in charter school payments. Our capital budget is expected to increase by 1.5 million. This also represents our operations and maintenance department in the school district, as well as our debt service, which is anticipated to increase 1.3 million associated with short-term borrowing for the North Albany Middle School project and the five-year plan. 
Our administrative budget has a reduction of 945,000, which means we have a year over year increase of just under 8.7 million. Looking at the proposed revenue, our local sources of revenue include our property tax levy as well as pilot payments. We are proposing a 0.95% property tax levy increase, which is equal to 1.1 million. However, we are still anticipating a reduction in our pilot payments next year of about half a million dollars, which is why you see a net difference of just under 540. Our state aid is anticipated to go up that $14 million based on the state budget. And then our federal aid reflects a decrease of 5.7 million. That is associated with the one-time CARES funds of 4.5 million, as well as a reduction in Medicaid reimbursement of 1.2 million. And lastly, we are anticipating using 2.5 million in appropriated fund balance and $600,000 in restricted reserves for a total budget of 270.2 million. Looking at an eight year tax levy history, three of those years, the district has proposed a tax levy increase of less than 1%. Two years, a 0% tax levy was proposed. And then in 2019-20 and 2020-21, a tax levy was proposed just under 2%. So our average annual increase over eight years of 1.01%. Our modest annual tax levy increase supports long-term fiscal planning and stability of the district, sustaining our programming over time, recalling that 80% of our annual budget is for our instructional program for our students and their wraparound services, the rising cost of healthcare at 10% annually over the last few years, and then in a typical year, 88% of our revenue comes from state aid and property taxes. So considering a 0.95% tax levy increase, the estimated impact on a home valued at $150,000 in the city would range between $31 for the year and $49 for the year, depending on whether or not you have STAR or whether or not it's enhanced. Looking at our revenue for next year, we have a comparison here of our recurring versus one-time revenue. It's important to note that of the $270 million, 267 of that is recurring revenue. The 3.1 million shown here as one-time reflects the appropriated fund balance and use of restricted reserves. The district will also receive one-time federal funds. One of those funds is Sarissa money, which was approved back in December of 2020. Based on our state aid run, we anticipate that allocation to be 13.5 million. Some of the things that we can use these dollars for include accelerated learning, upgrading ventilation systems, instructional technology, and social emotional supports for students. More recently, the ARP funds were approved in March, and based on our state aid run from April, we anticipate an allocation of 32.8 million. There is a learning loss grant set aside in that allocation of 1.2 million. These funds may be used for things such as summer learning, extended school year, comprehensive after school programming for students, accelerated learning, and protecting the health and safety of students and staff. It's important to note that for these funds, there is community engagement, and we anticipate holding those forums in late May and early June. Here is a multi-year revenue scenario that is based upon the 0.95% tax levy increase proposed for fiscal 22. It also assumes a 1% tax levy increase for fiscal 23, 24, and 25. It also recognizes that the state legislature has an intention of funding foundation aid fully by year 23, 24, which would be approximately $26 million in aid to the city school district of Albany. You'll see the total first total line of 270.2 million for next year and how that would increase over the next three years based on these assumptions. Below the line is the federal one time fund and here you'll see a, a proposed way of using those funds recognizing that that may transition or change as we move through each of the next three years. So proposition one on the ballot this year is our proposed budget for 270.26 million. Tomorrow we will be mailing the budget newsletter to all of our city residents. We have a virtual community budget presentation on May 11th at 6 p.m. and we'll be with Common Council for a budget presentation on May 12th at 5.30 p.m. 
Our vote day is May 18th and we are returning to in-person voting that day. So our Board of Education election will also be on the ballot that day. We have two seats up for election and both are incumbents seeking re-election, Board Vice President Vicki Smith and Board Member Shardar Shatour. Also the Albany Public Library has one Board of Trustees seat, uh, no, pardon me, two seats with one candidate appearing on the ballot. So it'll be right in. There is no library budget vote this year because there is no tax levy increase. So returning to in-person voting with the new COVID-19 absentee ballot option. This year, voters have the opportunity to vote absentee by stating they will allow concerns regarding potential exposure to COVID-19 as a reason for requesting the ballot. In-person voting will occur at 15 locations. We do have one different location this year for Ward 12. It will be at the Italian American Community Center. Masks and social distancing are mandatory and our polls are open from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. You can also find your voting location via a searchable database on the albanyschools.org website backslash budget. What happened if the budget is not approved? If a majority of voters do not approve the budget on May 18th, the board has three options. They may put forward the same proposal for another vote, present a revised budget for voter consideration, or adopt a contingency budget. If a proposed budget fails a second time, the district will have a contingency budget for 21-22. That may require cuts to specific areas, including cuts to staffing and programs. It prohibits any spending on student supplies, and it requires community groups to pay to use the district's facilities. Thank you very much, Ms. Roaring. That concludes our budget presentation for the budget hearing. Um, at this time, we do not have any questions. However, we do encourage the public to submit questions through our website, and it can be the regular website where we submit through albanyschools.org um, through that format, or we can submit information directly to the board of education. So we want to thank you very much for your attention this afternoon, and this concludes our budget hearing. Thank you very much. You're famous. The mic's on, who knew? Good evening, everyone. My name is Ann Savage, and I am the president of the City School District of Albany Board of Education. On behalf of the board, I welcome you to our virtual meeting. I am joined in person tonight by the entire board, board member El Minyawi, board member Mann, board member Chatur, board member Krejci, Vice President Wilson, no, Secretary Wilson, accidentally promoted her, Vice President Smith, <laughs> Superintendent Adams, Deputy Superintendent Roaring, Board Council Aloy, and the one and only Board Clerk, Tanya Bowie. Thank you all for being here with us in person tonight. In addition, we have many of the Superintendent's Cabinet available virtually. This meeting is being live streamed and the instructions to view the meeting are available at albanyschools.org forward slash BOE if you need to share those with anyone else. We will show the relevant slides and documents both in the virtual meeting screen as well as in the on the screens here in the room. You can also access them via that same albanyschools.org forward slash BOE link if you prefer to be able to control the slides yourself. Those of you joining us in person tonight know that we are meeting with necessary social distancing in place. Every person present had their temperature checked on their way into the building and filled out our standard COVID screener. We are all seated at the recommended social distance of six feet and everyone is and will continue to be wearing a mask unless they choose to remove it to be heard clearly while they're speaking. Because of the limits imposed by social distancing, um, we encourage members of the public to carefully consider whether they would like to attend virtually or in person, but you are plenty of room here at the Albany School of Humanities and we encourage you to come on down and visit with us in person if you would like. 
With that introduction, we invite those of you who choose to join us as we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In addition to the Pledge of Allegiance, we always focus our meeting by restating the mission of the City School District of Albany, which is to work in partnership with our diverse community to engage every learner in a robust educational program designed to provide the knowledge and skills necessary for success. Superintendent Adams, do you have a report for us? Good evening and thank you, Madam President and members of the board. I would like to begin tonight with a note of appreciation to our leadership, faculty and staff, students and families at Stephen and Harriet Myers Middle School and to the Albany Police Department for their response to the bomb threat at the school this afternoon. That threat came in at about 1.10 p.m. today. Principal Bill Rivers working together with Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Instruction, Lori McKenna, and our Director of School Safety, Vince Thompson, worked together to immediately implement security measures to allow for a thorough search of the building. Our security measures in a case such as this included both shelter in place and lockout procedures. We follow these procedures inside the building due to the potential increased risk of students and staff evacuating the building in response to this type of threat. Both our building security personnel and Albany Police Department K-9 units conducted searches of the entire building. They found no evidence of danger and Myers resumed its regular operations and dismissal procedures shortly after 2.30 p.m. I am grateful to all involved and for the thorough professional response to this matter and to our families for their patience and cooperation while we followed these steps to ensure safety. We have had an opportunity this week to take a few moments to give thanks to several of our employee groups for their exceptional work that they do to support our students and families. This week is Teacher Appreciation Week. We think about people, when we think about the people who have made a positive difference in our lives, there's almost always a teacher in the group. Our teachers have the power to positively impact the lives of our children each and every day. They strive to equip every learner with the academic tools they need to reach their potential. Just as significantly, teachers provide students with a sense of community and connection. This has been particularly vital during this past year when, when we have all been challenged by COVID-19 and our country, I'm sorry, and our county continues to experience acts of systemic racism and community unrest. These challenges have motivated our teachers to work even harder to inspire students to be critical thinkers and leaders, innovators and educators, healers and musicians. For these reasons and more, we recognize our teachers with respect and gratitude this week and every week. So congratulations to our teachers for Teacher Appreciation Week. We thank you. We also celebrated National School Principals Day earlier this week. It happened to be on Saturday, May 1st. Our building administrators play a vital role in the leading of our faculty and staff each and every day. Their leadership sets the tone for the building, something that has been critically important during this pandemic. I am so appreciative of our administrators' willingness to reflect on the best practices and make course corrections when needed. I also appreciate their steadfastness and our responsibility to look at our equitable practices on behalf of our students. And as we forge ahead and meet the needs of our students, families, faculty, and staff, please take a moment to thank your building principals and assistant principals for the dedication that they have displayed and will continue to display on behalf of our students. So we have one more group of people that we are thanking and today is National Nurses Day. Now more than ever, our school nurses do so much for our students and families each day, from soothing a frightened child to bandage, bandaging a scraped knee to dealing with medical emergencies and implementing our COVID-19 health and safety protocols. Our, our school nurses always serve us 
with compassion and excellence. During this past year in particular, particularly, they have gone above and beyond to assure that our students, faculty, and staff remain healthy and safe from COVID-19. Their professional care has been especially valued as we navigate this worldwide pandemic. Please let a school nurse know or any nurse in your life know how much their work is appreciated today and every day. I would also like to thank our partners at Whitney Young Junior Health Center for working with us to offer another COVID-19 vaccination clinic at Albany High School's Abrook and Career and Technical Center this month. Our second student vaccination clinic will be held Thursday, May 20th, with participants receiving their first dose of the Pfizer vaccine that day. And the second dose will be administered June 10th, also at a Brooklyn. All students who would like to receive the vaccine should complete a vaccine screening form and a registration form. You can find both forms at the Albany High section of our website. Both forms must be returned to the school nurse by May 18. If you have any questions, please contact Health Services Coordinator Suzanne McCarthy at 518-475-6174. Last month, we celebrated the selection of Albany High's newest participants in the New York State Education Department's My Brother's Keepers Fellows Program, Gideon Goldman and Marcus Treese. These young men were officially inducted into the program last week, and this afternoon, they spent time talking with the Times Union about what the opportunity means for them. So watch your local newspaper for a story about our exceptional students and this outstanding program. Albany High School is partnering with the City of Albany to offer a lifeguard training course for individuals 15 and older. The training will be a blended model with 19.5 hours in person and 7.5 hours online. Training will take place Monday, May 24th through Friday, May 28th from 3 to 9 p.m. each day. In-person instruction will take place at the Albany High Pool. To be eligible, students must have completed a pre-course swimming skills test. The lifeguard training costs $50. To register, please visit albanyschools.org slash lifeguard. You can also contact the Director of Athletics, Ashley Chapel, for more information at 518-475-6310. I would like to share a few calendar reminders now that we are into the month of May. There will be no school for students on Monday, May 17th and Tuesday, May 18th. All of our schools and offices will be closed May 17th for one of our unused snow emergency days. We have a scheduled professional development day for faculty and staff on May 18th. The following week, all of our schools and offices will be closed May 27th and May 28th to account for our final two unused snow emergency days of the year. Monday, May 31st is Memorial Day and all of our schools and offices will be closed that day as well. It is now my pleasure to welcome Sheridan Prep Academy Principal Zuleika Sanchez-Gale to tell us about the great things that are happening at her school this year. Good evening, everybody. I am also very um, excited to introduce my assistant principal, Tina Marie Casco. Good evening. Um, and we're here to um, talk a little bit about Sheridan Prep. Now, the presentation that is currently up is not the original. It, we had two, so that's our student interviews. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> so um, clearly Sheridan Prep follows the vision, mission, and the goals of the City School District of Albany. However, um, Along with those, we have fine-tuned our own set of school-based um, guiding principles. So our mission is that Sheridan Preparatory Academy believes that all teachers, students, and family members will expect the best in all we do, learn all we can, and strive to achieve our full potential because that's the Sheridan Prep way. 
Our vision is we expect to become the gateway of greatness for our students' future. And our values are our character education traits, um, cooperation, assertion, responsibility, empathy, and self-control, which spells the acronym CARES. And so every month we celebrate um, what we refer to as a CIA kid, a CARES in action child, um, and we celebrate um, specifically one of the character education traits. Um, you can follow us on YouTube and see our YouTube channel and you'll see our blue and gold days. Um, they are videotaped and played for our students monthly. And we are the Sheridan Prep Superstars. You wanna do this slide? This one's easy. <laughs> so our school administration and demographics. This is the principal, Zuleika Sanchez-Gale. I am the assistant principal, Tina Marie Cascone. We also have the honor and pleasure of working with the community school site coordinator, Abigail Gomes, and our homeschool coordinator is Mr. Stacy Randolph. Who was a part of the returning staff from the spring. So the demographics of our school is that we are pre-K through fifth grade school. Um, our special education population is about 12% of our school population. Um, we have co-teach um, settings typically and in a typical year. We are, it would have been kindergarten first, second, and third grade. Um, our co-teach model is increasing year by year. So our current co-teach students in third grade will then be in the fourth grade. Um, our ENL demographics, I think, um, Sheridan Prep may not be considered um, a school where there's a lot of language diversity when you first think of Sheridan Prep, but 13% of our students are ENL students, with Spanish and Arabic being the top two languages and often kind of swapping places between being first place or second place. Um, this year, um, our Spanish speaking students make up the biggest um, population of second language speakers. And then our ethnic de race and ethnic demographics, you'll see that our black students make up 57% of our student population. Our Latino students are increasing in population and we're making about um, 22, almost a quarter of our, our school. Um, our Asian population is at 8%. Our multiracial is at six percent, and our white and Pacific Islanders are about five percent of the school. So some of our um, focus and highlights this year. Um, try to say this with me: the pedagogical flow map. Um, that is a planning tool that we are um, giving a lot of intensive professional development time um, with our teachers, and so our teachers have been developing lessons using our curricular resources that dive deeper into um, questioning, release, and really focusing on intensifying the rigor of the instruction that's being delivered to students. And so we definitely use um, the grade level standards and our student data to support the work around the pedagogical flow map. I'll be testing you on that after this presentation is done to see who can pronounce it quickly. Um, the other thing that we really have been focusing on again is instructional rigor. Um, what we have noticed in our, I think, journey in our professional development at our school is that while we can be well planned, that doesn't necessarily always mean that the instruction that's being executed is actually aligned to what we planned. And so we're really putting a lot of focus on the level of student engagement and not just that students are having fun in a lesson or having hands-on activity, but really we're focusing a lot on the mind work and the thinking that the students are doing in order to access the, those grade level standards that we're planning for. We also have a high focus this year on attendance improvement. A couple of things that we feel have really have improved our practice this year is instead of just looking at pockets of students, we are looking at every student in the school building. So instead of being reactive to maybe students in the red, we're looking every single week at every single student to see how we can best serve them. We're also using Everybody uses a barrier worksheet. And so instead of us guessing or wanting to try to figure out what is the barrier for our families, we're really taking the time to 
build those relationships and understand that every week that support or stressor might look different and then how can we accommodate that? And so by doing the whole entire building, it's helped us to really not only build relationships with our students and our families, but with the teachers and helping them build relationships. And so by doing this, we have actually seen seen a level of improvement in being able to capture and support, even if it's been like kids that have been stable and having them have the positive phone calls and the positive. And so I feel like this year we've really kind of figured out identifying the barriers from the family's perspective and then supporting the whole family. So our challenges, as I mentioned with instruction, we are definitely pleased with the improvement and the work that our teachers have done and put in into their planning and making sure that it's grade level appropriate and aligned to the standards and that there is rigor in the student tasks that have been planned for. However, what we're really looking to improve upon for our next cycle is um, there's a education terminology of the productive struggle. And so we want to see our students struggling a little bit because that then that means they are thinking. Um, and then we are really focusing on student ownership of the work discussion and of questions. And so I think really moving um, the, the instructional practice from the teacher being the sage on the stage to really being the guide on the side and really focused on having students be at the forefront of where the learning will go during any given time. We're also taking a big focus in our climate and culture. Our students are meeting 80% or better at tier one, which is awesome and amazing. They understand the behavior expectations and we do have PBIS in our building. Being safe, be respectful and be responsible is just ingrained. But now we're trying to move from compliance to really self-advocacy. So a lot of the work we're doing in our CRE committee and PBIS is moving our focus next year into having students really be the voice and have participation in all of the teams and committees in the building so that they can really, they understand what they're supposed to do and they understand how to do it. And now we want them to be the leaders in the work. So I, I think the thing that we are really proud of, so I'll throw it back to Tina so she could talk a little bit about our attendance. So what, a lot of the work we've done around attendance this year, um, it, it's a huge beast attendance and it can get spun out of control very quickly. But this year we've really had processes in place to collect a lot of data so that we're following specific flow map. And by monitoring all the students and having case managers, we all have um, separated the work. And so in that, when we come to a meeting, it's very precise and laser focused. We know who and what we have to look at, what the steps need to take. And so it's been just a very fluid process this year. Also realizing that instead of it being something punitive, it really has just become a real support for families to understand we're on their side. We wanna make sure that they understand the correlation of being in school and the effect on the education. And so I feel like the procedures that we're putting in place this year are, is only gonna be strengthened by, by next year. And just to add to that, you know, having um, Mr. Randolph, our homeschool coordinator return has been a major mm -hmm. impact in our being able to support our families with any attendance issues. Um, since his return in March, he's he's done, I, I would say over a hundred home visits, um, just really reaching out to our families to find what those barriers are. Um, and some of those barriers might be not having a hotspot or maybe a Chromebook that's not working. And so really trying to make sure that any of the identified barriers are handled um, quickly. Um, it's been, I think, a monumental shift for us having Mr. Randolph come back. And in, in this year, I would add, it's been like no other because there's been a lot of movement. Families have really been struggling to stay in one place or have supports throughout the year. And so having someone that can go out immediately has really helped in the efficiency and the, the time that it takes to support a family. 
And so another success that we are really proud of is the use of our common planning time. As you all may be aware, um, our teachers are released about every other week for about two and a half hours. And so within that time, that is where the work of the pedagogical flow map is occurring, where our instructional coaches focus on ELA and math and science um, and assist our teachers in planning. Um, out of that work, I will say that there have been coaching cycles that have stemmed from that work where our coaches are actually participating in um, instructional delivery, modeling, and um, support with planning outside of the pedagogical flow map unit. Um, so it's really been provided a gateway for our coaches to really be actively involved in um, our teacher instruction. Um, and then I think the thing that both Ms. Cascone and I are probably the most proud of, um, and Superintendent Adams got to see a sneak peek of it last week, is in every common planning time, we do dedicate time specific to work around being culturally responsive and equity. And so we are not shying away from having courageous conversations mm -hmm. with our staff, and our staff is not shying away from having courageous conversations with us. Um, and I do think that um, having this equity work embedded in our common planning time and in our academic work helps to um, make all of the work that we're doing seem more cohesive versus having this equity committee on the side that's doing work. It, everyone is doing the work of equity in our building. So I think that's something that we're both really proud of. Um, and then if you, we, then you can hear from our kids who are always the best part of the, the work. They're always the best part. <laughs> So our student representatives are our fifth graders. Um, we're always super proud of our fifth graders. Um, these fifth graders have had obviously a different year. Um, so they haven't had the same opportunities as other fifth grade classes. Um, in, our, in our school, our fifth graders typically are our um, safety patrol representatives. They have lockers, they start practicing, they get the power pass, which they start practicing walking themselves in the hallways. And so we, they were not able to have some of those kinds of privileges, however, um, these we're, we're still super proud of all of the things that they have been able to accomplish. Um, all of these fifth graders have been career Sheridan prep students, so they have all been at our school since kindergarten, um, at least kindergarten. I think you're going to have to click a few times. <laughs> So was the hardest for you to so your favorite subject? Oh, okay, Mr. Great. Jim. Do you like Coach Warren? Oh, I mean... 
Great, great. Yeah. Is that the only okay? thing? Right now? Mm -hmm. Is there any teacher in particular that's like has been your favorite teacher? Do you have a favorite teacher you've had? Mm, I think I like all of them. All of them? That's a great answer. I'm going to miss all the teachers here and all the teachers that taught me. And I'm going to miss a lot of my friends here. I'm going to miss, the most thing I'm going to miss is the teachers who taught me all throughout this year I've been here. Um, all the teachers that supported me when I didn't even know English much. Uh, Miss Gail, uh, the principal, because uh, she's really nice and fun. Do you have a super favorite teacher? No, I can't choose. Best memory? Well, my best memory for right now, it will be just like walking home because I've never got to walk home in any other years that I was in the school. My favorite memory of going to school here has to be Oh, caroling on the stairs? Yeah. Great. Mine is caroling down the stairs and going on field trips. Um, yeah. I think going on field trips was my best memory. Uh, the best memory was uh, last year, fourth grade, actually, that's two years ago. Uh, fourth grade when we had um, when it was winter and uh, one of the reading teacher came and gave us blankets and we made blanket boards in fourth grade. That was really fun. I think if you see the presentation on your own, the video and the voice quality might be a little bit better, but we were super sweet and we're really proud of our kids. Thank you very much for the presentation, the opportunity to present. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And it is so wonderful to see our children. And I especially love um, what their memories are going to be. That is just amazing. And I will add, I did have the pleasure of sitting in on the professional development. And it was the conversation was very rich. But what I found that was most rewarding, not only listening to the conceptual theoretical thought, but looking at how they're putting it into action with regard to if this is where we are within our equity stance, what are the examples of where we are and where do we want to be and what's the evidence of that? So it was listening to that actionable piece of how do we go from what we think, feel, and believe into putting it into the action. And so I want to commend you on that work and it was a pleasure to sit in. So thank you so very much. That Pleasure, concludes the know, superintendent's report. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we'll go straight to the district update. So we will move right into our district update. And uh, I wanted to say that we have quite a bit to update about. And then we have an item that is also in routine consent so that we can get started with some of the details. And I'll just provide you with an overview with regard to the feeder alignment committee that we have been talking about for several years now. And we are ready to start that process. And, um, but when I get to that slide, we'll talk about that. And then of course, there'll be time for questions 
um, but it is just very high level to initiate the work so that we can get started with more of those details. But as we get started with our district update, we always start with our guiding principles, our vision, mission, and goals to make sure that all of the decisions that we are making align with our vision, mission, and goals. Um, we also want to make sure that tonight in this particular portion of the meeting, the discussion topics that we're going to address for the update, I'll provide you an update with the COVID-19 update information. Uh, Ms. Roaring will present the fiscal update for the current school year. We will have um, a review and some additional activities that have been planned for the fourth quarter to keep you abreast of that. A little preview about some of the instructional planning for the fall. And then of course the feeder alignment committee conversation. And then we have the impact on Toast Elementary School, Toast Magnet School with regard to the Beaver Creek Clean Water Project. So we wanna make sure that the board is updated with regard to what we are doing there. As of 5-5-21, we have 362 confirmed uh, positive cases of COVID-19, which would be involving on-site individuals 190 and off-site individuals 172. Um, so far, we are seeing our numbers go down, so everything is headed in the right direction. As of May 5th, we are averaging one new case per day during the month of May. We still have guidance that we are following. Contact tracing is changing and the quarantine guidelines are changing. And so we're trying to keep everyone abreast of that. But those things are changing very, very rapidly. And so we will have updates on that information. Uh, we are confirming those with uh, Dr. Staff. So as your letters are coming out, you will be seeing that, you know, there may be three students, but there were zero contacts. That's because some of the time limits have changed with regard to exposure, as well as where they were within their travel. So we know that that looks a little confusing, but that's because we are in the midst of some of those guidelines that are changing. We are continuing with our cleaning and sanitization practices. Um, I still want to commend all of our employees, students and staff with regard to staying vigilant with regard to that. That doesn't mean that we have 100% of everyone remembering to pull up their mask. I mean, we have a group of students that are just coming back and getting in the habit of doing that, uh, but we are still making sure that we are wearing masks, that we are following the hand hygiene procedures, and that we are still social distancing. I'll turn the next few slides over to Ms. Roaring, our Deputy Superintendent, to discuss the financial impact for this current school year. Thank you, Superintendent Adams. Um, the information I'm going to share in the next three slides has remained relatively consistent. Um, I do want to acknowledge on this slide here where we look at our fiscal impact and our anticipated savings due to the reductions, we are acknowledging the 2.58 planned appropriate fund balance for next year and netting that out to an anticipated savings of 4.1 now at the end of the year. Looking at the next slide, this also it remains constant. We have acknowledged all of our expenditures uh, through late March um, on our unplanned items. And we are at a total of that 5.48, pardon me. We have uh, submitted through our expenditures through mid-September were submitted to FEMA. We have continued not to hear much from them in terms of what they will or will not approve. Uh, we also have started the application process for the new window that has slightly different guidelines on what's eligible, um, but that window opened on January 22nd and we will pursue whatever we can. And lastly, our staffing update. This has held steady since the action on April 15th to bring back three additional staff. So we remain at 180 uh, quarter three and quarter four additions. And seven of those positions are funded by community school aid. So at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Cecily Wilson Turner and Ms. Lori McKenna to talk to us about some of the updates for the fourth quarter. Good evening. I think my I'm not sure if my video is showing, but um, it is on, so hopefully it will come back in. But we are um, working away with our moving up ceremonies at the elementary school level. As mentioned um, at the previous board meeting, we are um, looking for our in-person ceremonies for the fifth grades and sixth graders um, in our elementary schools that still had sixth grade this year to ensure that they all have a moving moving up ceremony. 
um, closer to what a traditional ceremony would have been, where they are able to bring guests in alignment with the current um, New York State Department of Health guidelines for our celebration ceremonies. And so we're excited to offer that. We are also working diligently to make sure that there is a more streamlined and more likely a reverse parade um, or smaller celebration for our pre-K and kindergarten um, students. And actually, I think Ms. Hasty said it's a uh, not a moving up ceremony, it's a hooray, we're moving to K ceremony. Um, and so we're really trying to make sure that we have a, a wonderful experience for each of our students um, who've worked so hard in this very different year. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so at the middle um, school level, we are continuing to plan our moving up ceremonies. Those dates have been determined, as I mentioned um, at our last board me meeting of June 25th. And we're also planning um, some eighth grade celebrations, including an eighth grade dance. Um, those details have not been finalized yet, so I'm hoping at the next board meeting um, I will be able to share um, all of the details for both the moving up ceremonies and the eighth grade celebrations. Uh, those plans are due on May 14th. And so I know at the next meeting, I'll be able to share those details. In addition to the moving up ceremonies and the eighth grade celebrations, we are also working um, with our middle school principals and assistant principals on um, uh, making some school visits to our elementary um, buildings for our rising sixth graders. Um, so our middle school principals, school counselors, and assistant principals will visit our in-person fifth graders um, sometime in June uh, to welcome them as a middle school student. And then we will also do something very similar um, in a virtual environment for our virtual fifth graders um, rising to sixth grade. Um, we have started conversations uh, for what our um, transition program will look like um, this summer. Uh, for students who are new to um, our middle schools as well, but those are um, in the very early stages of, of being developed. So more information to come on those. Um, high school, um, again, we are continuing to work on our end of the year recognitions and celebrations that I mentioned um, last time, including um, our prom, senior class field trips. Um, hopefully you were all able to see some of the pictures from our college acceptance day on May 3rd. Those were wonderful. Um, also the lawn signs that I mentioned, uh, the senior superlatives, um, and again, the sponsored photos um, on our CDTA buses. Uh, the other um, thing that I just wanted to mention um, around graduation uh, for June 26th and, and 27th with the updated guidance that the Department of Health just came out with um, is looking at um, fewer graduation ceremonies because we can have um, our graduates separated from our guest, which will allow us to have 200 guests if it is held outside. So, um, and our graduates are not included in that count. So that's really good news for us. Uh, and as we begin to finalize those plans, um, we will absolutely share out the details uh, again um, as soon as possible. And those plans again for the high school as well, um, May 14th. Thank you very much. As we move forward uh, with regard to what's happening now in terms of our planning for the 21-22 school year, we are looking at a full in-person model in alignment with the guidance that was released from the New York State DOH on April 9th. Um, in-person hybrid models similar to where we are for the fourth quarter, what we're seeing, and then an additional virtual option pending the state education department guidance. The next slide shows the transmission, uh, community transmission rates and what it looks like for low, moderate risk of transmission, substantial risk of transmission and high. Um, a few days ago, we were at substantial and we're headed to moderate and almost to low. And so that's really good news for our community, especially as we are planning for the fall. I know that there are many questions about how quickly can we pivot right now within the fourth quarter with approximately eight weeks left of school. And there are challenges that not only our district is facing, but other districts as well. Superintendents meet weekly with VOCES. And at this juncture, we are reviewing what some of those challenges are um, that we all have in common to see if there are any workarounds uh, right now as we are planning for the fall 
and looking at summer school planning and looking at how we're going to close our achievement gaps, we are seeing a number of challenges with regard to uh, pivoting, if you will, right now to making drastic changes to our schedule where our students just came back to school. We've just received this guidance roughly five, six days ago and trying to look at what are the ways that we can have more students back within the last eight weeks of school. Uh, there are numerous challenges with regard to um, getting students back, uh, moving to three feet, looking at engaging our communities with regard to those conversations in looking at how we reduce uh, from six feet to three feet. As you can see at the bottom of the slide, there are still six feet distancing requirements that have to be maintained. And so if we're not able to maintain that six feet social distancing, even if we are increasing students in the classroom by three feet, we have a disconnect. So that while the classrooms may be at three feet, breakfast, lunch, even if it's grab and go, we still have common areas where we have to maintain six feet. And so I'll, I'll add to this at a very different level. Uh, the 92 superintendents for the capital region and other BOCES have presented a united letter to our um, not only DOH, but also to our legislators, because we need very clear guidance without that conflict so that if we are going to be back in school, you know, we're not having lunch and I'm going to exaggerate for effect. So I'll say that right up front. You know, it, there's a challenge with how many lunches we have to have at the high school. And if we're starting lunch and again, exaggerating for effect at eight o'clock in the morning, as soon as kids get there with breakfast now, 30 minutes later, because we need to accommodate lunch with six feet social distancing, it's problematic because then we have to build in more lunch periods and we don't have the staffing for that. And that presents a huge challenge. So as we look at it, um, that bottom piece of what you see where we have to maintain social distancing in larger areas, et cetera, it does present, especially at the secondary level, a challenge of moving our students to three feet social distancing at this time. Doesn't mean that we're not looking at it, but these are challenges that are very realistic. And I know it sounds very simple to say, well, my child is in a classroom of only three students, five students, 10 students, but that may not be the schedule for every student that comes back. And so now we have to look at if I am in one class for first period and there are 10 students in the class, now my second period, I might be the 16th student in the class that pushes that class out of compliance with three feet. So we have approximately 870 students that are still virtual. We would have to review and not that we cannot do it. I'm gonna put it in perspective. Yes, we have the ability to review 875 schedules to see if each class would keep, if that student comes back, if that student could return to school and have a full schedule without changing the schedule that would not impact three feet social distancing and the maximum number of students in the class. Do we have the ability to do that? Yes. Do we have the capability of doing that in combination with the regular job responsibilities that people have during the day in order to accommodate that? That is the challenge. That is the challenge. And so when we look at that, it is we have definitely proven that we want our students back in school because we have been very creative about how to get our students back. But there are logistical challenges that we have that may not make that possible as we move to the end of the school year because the same people who would be doing that are also building a master schedule for the fall right now. And master schedules are not built in five minutes with all of the offerings that we have for our students and everything that we're looking to do for them. We don't want to sacrifice. And this is part of the letter that the superintendents have put out with regard to the, you know, going to the DOH as well as going to our legislators. We want to maintain the course offerings for our students. We don't want to limit that because this is what we do, the education of our children. And so in order to keep the offerings available for our students, the challenge becomes 
what then do we have to sacrifice or what to, what decisions do we have to make as we look in the best interest of our students? And so I know that um, those are challenges that are always behind the scenes, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have an impact. And it doesn't mean that we're not thinking about students first because we are. And we know that as we move forward, looking at the numbers going down the way that they are, um, we are really asking for clear guidance as we move forward, looking at hopefully a low or no, wouldn't that be fabulous? No transmission rate, but looking at a low moderate transmission rate so that we can have as many of our students back in school as possible when we look at the fall. The next slide I wanna share with you looks at exactly what that looks like with three feet social distancing. At our elementary level, we are looking at, we are planning for three feet social distancing based on student selections, meaning either virtual or in person, 75% building capacity, that students would be in school five days, and that would be full in person. If the selections at the elementary level exceed in a building 75%, then we look at the split classroom structure, or if space is not available, there may be certain schools where space is available, which is what we currently do now. We may have to reseat students in other schools, but still keeping them tied to their home school. So that's something that we do currently, and it's something that we would most likely have to continue. At the middle level, uh, and it really mirrors the first part with regard to the high school as well. So middle school and high school are the same in terms of three feet social distancing, looking at 75% building capacity. And we have looked at that on a numerical basis that when we, seat, when we stage the classroom at three feet at 75% selection of in-person, we would be able to have our students in five days a week. If it exceeds that, then at the middle level for seventh and eighth grade, we would be looking at a hybrid model. And then at the high school, we would be looking at a hybrid model. And that would mean students would attend every other day. We still have our self-contained special education students full in person, five days. And then the virtual option, again, this is contingent upon the State Department of Education providing guidance with regard to that. Um, most likely that would still be a consideration. Uh, we have not heard that that option will be taken away. So we will be sending out a survey to our families as soon as tomorrow so that our parents can make a selection with regard to virtual or in person. And so these are the structures that we would be looking at provided, and I always have to say provided, provided we stay in low, moderate or substantial transmission rate. It is completely tied to the transmission rate, what we do for the fall. And so I cannot impress enough how important it is for us to continue to abide by the COVID guidelines so that we can stay safe and we can stay healthy and we can reduce the transmission rates so that we can have as many of our students back as possible. The next piece is the feeder alignment committee. This is a part of the conversation that we have had for a, a very long time, even before my tenure here, but even more so now as we look at the board making a decision of whether we need the four middle schools or three larger elementary, I mean, three larger middle schools. And so in doing that, we know that tied to that, we will need to have feeder alignment, and we need to look at what those conditions will be and what those recommendations will be. And so the purpose of this committee would be to engage community members and district personnel in a partnership to develop criteria and make recommendations for an equitable feeder pattern for all students transitioning from pre-K um, to fifth grade or elementary school to middle school, grades six through eight. Now, this work, may impact our elementary catchment areas, which may expand the scope of this committee. But we didn't wanna say that right away because we don't know what's going to come forward from the committee. And so we're looking at roughly 17 to 20 committee members. Each school will be represented on the committee. 
we are looking for current parents and guardians of district students. And so there is an application process, albanyschools.org slash committee. And we are looking for letters of interest. And in the letter of interest, the following criteria, name, address, phone number, and email, number of students in the district and the schools attending, statement explaining your interest in participating on the committee, expectations of the work and outcomes, skills and contributions which will benefit the committee. And we're asking that this letter of interest be submitted by June 4th, 2021. The actual meeting times and dates will be set for the summer and the fall. Um, at this time, uh, those we, of course, we don't have anyone who has signed up for that because this is just being announced tonight. So I don't want people to think that, oh my goodness, I haven't heard this before. No, you haven't. This is the first time we wanted to bring it to the board first. It will be posted on our website. We will send out a splash, um, SNN, et cetera, so that people have multiple ways of getting their information submitted. And so we are looking for substantial participation and we, we will post that information as soon as either this evening or tomorrow morning. The last piece of information has to do with Beaver Creek Clean Water Project. And this is the city's project, which we know um, Mayor Sheehan came and talked to us about this project. And we know that this is part of that um, environmental equity and uh, piece that we have been looking at. And so there is an impact with regard to Toast Elementary School. And we have been working very closely with the city and the water department so that we can make sure that we are able to provide options for what's going to happen during the construction phase. And so we did send a letter out to our community. We have met with our faculty and staff. We have provided drawings with regard to where the new loop will be in front of the school. We are displacing approximately 20, I should say the city is displacing approximately 20 parking spaces during this construction time. We have taken the parking lot at Sunshine School we have striped the parking lot. We are getting a light there in the parking lot. Uh, we know that during the summer, it would be fine. However, during the fall, when it starts to get dark at four o'clock, we want to make sure that we have proper lighting. Uh, we're also looking at widening the pathway where the students will walk. There is a, a road that goes between the school and the tennis courts and soccer field down there. And unofficially, we're naming it Toast Road. Um, so we are making that a one-way street so that it now the traffic will not be going both ways. So parents can come in, drop their students off. We're extending the walkway directly to the school and then going around and out through the other side in a one-way fashion. I, I believe that's Martin Luther King, that street. That's where traffic will exit. Um, we have also added a couple of parking spaces in the Sunshine parking lot. Uh, we are also going to work with the city to see that in that little road, if we can add some parallel parking spots along the side there as well, once you clear that corner, uh, so that we can make sure that, especially in the fall, when faculty and staff are back, that we have ample parking. Um, the front of the school will primarily be used for uh, handicap parking, as well as our bus drop off. So with that, I would like to um, turn it over for any questions. And we have notified uh, Hackett Middle School in case there are any implications there. Um, I will say this, the other thing that we're trying to do is get a yellow flashing light down where the entrance is. And also we're trying to make that a left, no, a right turn only so that that way coming down Delaware, you're not able to turn left so that traffic doesn't build up. Um, so those are things that we will be working on through the summer um, and then we'll see what happens. Thank you very much. A lot of information, a very little of it uh, familiar from past presentations, a lot of new things this time. Um, does anyone have a particular question they wanna start with and then whatever that topic is, we'll just continue on that topic until we're done. Board Member Mann. Is that a question? Okay, great. So I'm going back to slide number, I think it's eight. Where is it here? It's about um, 
slide before that. Okay. I know that um, uh, Ms. Roaring talked about um, how we submitted expenses um, through mid-September to FEMA and we're still awaiting uh, their response. Have they given any indication as to when reimbursements will be dispersed? Slide seven. They have not given any indication as to even when we will find out what they may have approved or disapproved. So we are in a holding pattern. We are checking in regularly with our local FEMA representative. Okay. And do we have an awareness have other schools received any reimbursement or is everyone in the same boat? Uh, I'm not aware of the oh, other okay. status. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else have follow on questions on the topic of money or those first couple of slides um, so that we can dispense with those and move on? Dr. Chatur. Is there something the government relations team can approach to follow up on the FEMA? Is, is there anything the government relations group can advocate for with FEMA or? I'm sure a letter would probably be fine, but it's just a matter of the timing of getting it back. Um, I will say from superintendent's view, we have not heard any more than what we have. I can't speak to any particular school district, but we're all in that same position. And so monies will be rolled out as they are. But a letter asking for clarity on when we can expect it, I don't see why that would hurt anything, but we are all in holding pattern, just waiting for the responses of when we're going to get those funds. Okay. Anything else on any fiscal questions? All right, does anyone have another topic they'd like to introduce? A question that they want to ask about? Dr. Board Member El Minyawi. Um, I suppose this would fall under uh, instructional planning slash um, just the COVID update in general. Um, so I know uh, our schools are have different COVID start and end times as of right now. Is that going to continue into next year? So I will, other than the, and I will ask um, Dr. Wilson Turner and Ms. McKenna to chime in. But other than the regular early start, late start that we normally have for our elementary schools, that will be consistent. And then with the secondary, are we looking at different start times? No, no our 9th and 12th graders will be on the same cell schedule, and our 6th or 8th or 8th graders will be on the same cell schedule. I'm sorry. Here, here. Right, right. Ms. McKenna, could you just say that again more clearly? Because um, right now we're on a different best spell schedule than a regular year. I'm thinking particularly of Albany High, which used to start at 7.50 or something, and now I think is starting at 8.30 or something. It, what, so what yes, do we yes. have a known plan for next year, or is that still TBD? No, we, we do have a plan. Are you guys hearing an echo on your end, or am I fine? No, we can hear you okay. Okay. Uh, so the high school entry into the high school will be 8.30. Our first period class will be 8.50. Um, and end time will be 3.30 for high school. At the middle level, six through eight, students will um, begin at 8.03 and end at three o'clock. So I think that's consistent with what you had told us back when we first started about in, talking about instructional planning, although the new, that definitiveness on the middle school is new. Um, so that's, that's good to hear. So we're back, we are consistent with our essentially our original times from for middle school slightly later for Albany High and the original regular quote unquote regular times for our elementary students. So you were either an eight o'clock school or a nine o'clock school and you will be either an eight o'clock school or a nine o'clock school next year. Correct for the secondary schools and I'll defer to Dr. Wilson Turner for elementary. And correct for elementary. We are looking to return to our normal start and end times. Okay, and um, you know, we could probably put that on that that slide, that instructional planning slide, because I know it's come up a couple of times. So great. Anyone else with questions about next year? Since that was the topic, Mr. Almanyawi introduced questions about next planning for next year. I have one quick one, which is for next year, um, if we're at that the high end at that like seventy five percent rate. Is that manageable with the lunch scheduling? I know that that was something you just raised, the, the possibility of you know needing more lunches because we're still at six feet. So if we're still under the current guidance and we're at the top end of that 75%, is that still 
manageable for lunch. Ms. McKenna, I'll start and just correct me if I'm wrong. I think the concern is if it goes over the 75%, that's where that concern comes. So at 75%, we think we can still manage the six foot separation for lunch. Okay. Yeah, at the middle level, uh, we currently and will continue to do this. Um, half of our sixth graders, for example, um, will spend 20 minutes in the cafeteria and the other um, kiddos for that lunch period will spend 20 minutes in a, I'm gonna call it a recess period, but um, in more of a um, unstructured study hall. Uh, and then after 20 minutes, they flip flop. So it is reduced by the 50%. Our concern remains um, at Albany High School with the capital project and we'll work through that. Um, uh, Jody Comerford and the leadership team are working through that right now. I don't have all the details, but that is something that we are working through for next year. Okay, so other questions about next year, Dr. Chatur. Just to follow up on the lunch, the breakfast and lunch thing. So when you do the survey, is there a question that asks the parents, do they, if they can choose, if let's say they don't want the breakfast or lunch, is that question being asked? And, and if so, if, if, if there are a, a, a cohort of kids who don't want the breakfast, would that alleviate some of the pressure? They, we still have to, those students are still on campus. So we still have to house them somewhere. So I think maybe that's something that we can look into, but no, we're not asking about lunch because that's in their schedule. So, you know, breakfast is grab and go directly into the classroom. So we managed to work through that. But when it comes to the lunches, we'd have to be able to schedule that whether they want lunch or not, they still have to have a place to go. Okay. Other questions about planning for next year? Oh, Ms. Smith, go ahead. And, and I think, uh, thank you uh, all for this. I think uh, the answer is probably uh, what I think it is in my head, but this is again about the virtual academy. Um, so I, I noticed that SED did put out the guidelines for summer school, which included that virtual option. And I wasn't sure whether an assumption could be made that it was more likely that they would allow for that to occur also in the fall. Uh, if not, do we have any indication uh, as of yet of when they'll make that decision? No, we do not. Okay. Okay. Them and FEMA. Nobody tells us when they're going to make their decision. Other questions about next year? Okay. Oh, go ahead. Just, sorry. Um, and I'm really delighted that we're able to move quickly with getting our surveys out. Uh, and however, I, you know, I was thinking to myself, boy, that's really soon. Um, because again, everything, things just change so frequently and so often. Um, do we, we do it now? Is there some, and maybe someone was getting at this, is there some opportunity to check back in with parents again in the middle of the summer or, you know, before school starts to just make sure or confirm? And in that way, we'll be also basing that, they'll be basing that decision on what they know at a future, you know, at that current moment. So I'm going to say it depends. It depends on the guidance from New York State Department of Health. If we make a drastic change in a different direction, that's going to impact what we do. If we stay on the trajectory that we're on, this is the path that we're on. So I, I can't say absolutely definitively no updates. We have to wait and see what happens. So the survey, I'm just gonna ask a follow-up question. The survey that you're planning relatively soon is going to ask the question, uh, assuming that things are looking kind of like they look now, would you choose in-person or virtual education next fall? But we still don't know if we're going to even be able to legally offer virtual education next fall because we're still waiting for the guidance from the, from not from the Department of Health, but from the Department of Education. While we don't know, we are still planning to offer virtual a virtual option because without zero social distancing, there are very few school districts who can accommodate 100% of their students. I'm just thinking about the way the question sort of has to be worded. It has to be worded as, dear parent, 
if a virtual academy is enough or if a virtual option is available to you next mm -hmm. fall and if the covid transmission rate is comparable to what we're facing right now this would you choose a correct. virtual option or would you choose an in-person option um that's going to have to be with the question correct. so there's there's a lot of um there's a lot of ifs in that or, or assumptions that you have to build into that statement that is correct okay. and superintendent adams that is the way that we wrote the, that question I figured it would have to be, right? Yes. It has to be that way. Vicki, you had one more? No, and really not a question, just a comment. I uh, I hesitated to even ask that question <laughs> because I I know everyone is anxious to get back to some sort of normal, but we're also trying to be very cautious um, and things change every day. I, I do appreciate though your responding uh, earlier in your comments about this sort of your, we're planning, we're in that mode of trying to make sure we can or attempt to get all of our students back 100%, but we have to take into account certain things. Um, so I do appreciate very much the, the, and I can't even imagine all of it, the planning and the time that you and staff and cabinet and principals and everyone puts into this. Um, but so I, I do appreciate that and wanted to make that acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on the district update? Um, not pertaining to next year unless we're still, I think we're done with next year. What's next, Dr. Storr? So I had a question about the feeder alignment committee. I mean, the whole purpose of the committee is to engage all stakeholders towards defining how this would go, right? I see that we are, we are asking for current parents and guardians with students in the district, but there are also other committee members who may not have a student in the district, but are very involved. And I know a lot of them were involved in the last phase of the grade reconfiguration uh, meetings that were there. So should be just restricted to parents and guardians or have a little bit more for other people who may not be parents or guardians, but are still very connected community partners to the district. We can look and see, but the, the rationale was those people who are directly impacted. And that's why, been, that's why part of it is looking at current parents and guardians, because they're the ones who are directly impacted by that those decisions that right, may but there are other people. I was just thinking in terms of people who are advocates for certain groups who are not themselves outspoken or whatever. In particular, thinking of maybe the refugee community right, um, right. or those folks who might not feel super comfortable functioning um, at that high level in English, maybe some advocate. We, we can provide support. And, and I think what we what we do is we we're going to we're going to present this information to our administrators so that they can work with their own communities to look at people to really support and be a part of it. So if those supports are needed, I think because it's not just a high level superintendent asking a question, this it takes more than these two hands to get the work done. And so this information will be going to our school leaders so that they can work more closely with people who may be interested, those who may be kind of on the edge, what support they might need so that we can have a diverse group of families represented. Yeah, it's uh, fantastic to try to, to aim for getting representation from every single school. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the first time we successfully did that if we're able to do that. So I commend you for the attempt and I commend the principals for all the work they will have mm -hmm. to do working with individual families to um, to encourage them to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, Absolutely. It's, it's really going to be a, a, an important aspect of it. Anything else on the feeder committee? Any other questions from the presentation? Board Member El Minyawi? It's actually just a general concern about Beaver Creek. I know that there's a lot of construction going on as I pass by and I have full confidence in the folks at Toast. I just want to make sure that um, our students are not, um, there's no, I guess, interaction between uh, vehicles, construction vehicles and our students and there's, you know, clear separations and that they're when they're out in the playground or whatever it is that they're safe. That's not a question. It's just like a parent concern. <laughs> and so just for a little reassurance, our playground is on the back side of the school, which is the south side of the school. And that's not where the construction is happening. That's happening all the way on the north side of the building. We do have, uh, there are cones that are already out there, traffic patterns already determined. We do know that the city is looking at putting a traffic light at that uh, intersection there. We don't know exactly when that is going to happen, but we know that that is in the plans, uh, as well as one of the reasons that we have put those parking spaces 
up at the Sunshine School um, to help alleviate some of that traffic. Uh, the only thing that will be happening in the front of the school will be the bus drop off and um, our pre-K, I believe, is still going to come to the front, but it's right in front of the door and there's no construction on the school side of, of the street. And so we feel very comfortable with that um, because those precautions have been made already. So thank, thank you. you very much for the hard work. I know that you all have done with the city to try and get this, um, well, you know, it's so common that two different things are happening on two different tracks and the tracks don't align until suddenly, oh, they're really aligning now. Um, so we understand um, how much work it was to get this done so quickly and effectively to provide options for our parents and for our staff because um, it's, it's a difficult situation and I really appreciate all the hard work to make that happen. Um, other questions on the district update? I had a quick question about this year. Do we know what our status is on our tents? I know we were hoping for tents this week. Where where are we on tents? They have shipped. Ship we are awaiting their arrival and have plans to deploy them at each building very quickly thereafter. Any idea when that might happen? When the rain stops, right? But <laughs> do we have an estimated arrival? It would be, day? we anticipate them no later than Monday. Okay. Uh, we do need the ground to harden up a little bit though to be able to do yes. it because they are 400 square feet. So. Yes, a little a little not rain would be good. Thank you. And I also wanted to um, thank, I think it was Lori who talked a little bit about the elementary to middle school transition for this year. And I appreciate your commenting on that. I know we worked incredibly hard at the end of 2019, at the end of the school year in the spring of 2019 to really ramp up that elementary to middle school transition process. And it was so great. And then we didn't get to do it last year and we can't really quite do it this year. So um, I long for the days that we can get back to it, but I appreciate your, your doing your best to do it something in this very strange year. Absolutely. We are trying really hard to get back to some sort of normalcy for, all, for our students. <clears throat> okay, I think we're ready to move off the district update on that. Okay. All right, so that now brings us to our public comment period. Um, as always, the board sets aside 30 minutes of our meeting by policy to hear from the members, members of the public. We really appreciate everyone who takes the time to either comment in person or by voicemail or through our web-based form. Um, all of that information and all of that contact information is at albanyschools.org forward slash BOE on the addressing the board link. Um, all comments that come in by any means are required to have a commenter's name in place of residence. We do not accept any anonymous comments. I note that in particular because we have been getting an increasing number of anonymous comments through our public comment form. And while we appreciate you and love you out there who want to comment to us, you need to give us your name if you would like your comment read into the record. We do ask that comments not in person be made at least six hours prior to the meeting. That gives us time to collect and verify them as needed. Names such as Mickey Mouse do require a certain level of verification, um, and those are treated as anonymous. We cannot verify them and not read. Um, we do ask commenters to keep in mind also that information about individual students and specific district staff can't be shared. Not only is that a violation of privacy, but we expect every student and every staff member to be treated with respect, and they deserve to know that concerns about them will not be aired in public. For that reason, if board members are reading written comments, we will pass over or substitute alternative words if individuals' names are mentioned. We will also eliminate those names and descriptions um, as possible from recorded voicemails. Please also keep in mind that public comment is not the best place to first alert the district to concerns. We ask that you share concerns first with relevant staff, such as the teacher or principal. If you feel the concern is not addressed adequately, you may appeal to that person's supervisor up the chain of command, if necessary to the superintendent, Decisions by the superintendent may be appealed to the board. As we have for a few board meetings now, we do have one voicemail in Spanish for tonight's meeting. It was in fact a uh, one that came in after the deadline, but prior to last board meeting. So it's uh, it's not current, um, but we, we do wanna honor everyone who takes the time to um, provide a comment by reading, by listening to that tonight. After we listen to the voicemail, board member Mann will read the English translation, and then she has a couple of other um, letters to read. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Baker. 
Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Ana Méndez. Tengo dos niños en el programa bilingüe de Delaware Community School. Y el próximo año va a empezar mi hijo pequeño. Yo no estoy de acuerdo con el cambio que quieren hacer con el programa. No me gusta la zona donde va a estar ahora. Mi pregunta es, ¿qué va a pasar si yo decido no mandar mis hijos al programa? Por ejemplo, mi niño pequeño, ya la lotería de Toy K ya se hizo. ¿Qué va a pasar si yo decido no enviarlo a, a ese, al nuevo building? Porque no me agrada nada la zona donde, donde, donde quieren trasladar el programa. Por favor, yo necesito que alguien se comunique conmigo y me diga algo. Necesito saber. Mi número de teléfono es 5. Muchas gracias y buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Mendez, and I have two children in the bilingual program at Delaware Community School. Next year, my youngest son is going to start. I am not in agreement with the change that they want to make to the program. I don't like the zone that the school is going to be in. My question is, what is going to happen if I decide not to send my child to the program? For example, my youngest child, they already did the lottery. What will happen if I don't send him to the new building? I am not pleased with the zone where they are trying to move the program to. Please, I need someone to communicate with me and tell me something. I need to know. My, she provides her telephone number and thank you and have a good afternoon. Okay, okay this public comment is from a community member, uh, uh, Lily, uh, Lily Mercoglino Easton, and I apologize if I messed up any of the pronunciations. Okay, uh, I appreciate the tremendous work the district continues to do to support our families through this pandemic. The concern of individuals at every level is highly visible right now and vitally important. I am writing out a concern for how the district is prioritizing elementary school students skill building during this unusual time. What I have seen particularly the last few months is a heavy focus on singular standards, exacting test prep exercises, and a continued pattern of little to no project-based learning or collaborative work. As we move ahead next year, I'm wondering how this will change. To what extent will the use of instructional computer programs at the elementary level be used to differentiate student learning instead of projects or increased classroom support? How will the idea of catching students up disrupt a return to a more appropriate pace in our classrooms? I'm also concerned about the added stress that departmentalization can add to our rising third grade elementary students who have had a completely abnormal instruction trajectory out of kindergarten. While I appreciate that if executed under the very best circumstances for some students and some teaching teams, departmentalization can be beneficial. How will such circumstances be guaranteed district-wide and during this particular moment in time? How does departmentalization optimize students' social and emotional well-being during a time of unprecedented stress for families? Further, I'm grateful for the thorough answer to questions that I submitted to the budget presentations about departmentalization on Tuesday, but was left even more concerned by the assertion that student test scores and student engagement are inextricably linked. My daughter is most engaged at school in art class and when making things in STEAM based modules. Her data never reflects this engagement, quite the opposite, really. There's actually more to this public comment, but we have a limit of 300 words, correct? 400. 400 words, okay. So I'm going, I'm actually going to continue because the top says uh, the first 300. Okay, go okay. ahead. Okay. All right, um, excuse me, let me just start this last paragraph, I, uh, the second to last paragraph. My daughter is most engaged at school in art class and when making things in STEAM-based modules. Her data never reflects this engagement, quite the opposite, really. Her data consistently reflects the lack of open-ended exploration and project or play-based learning available. And we know that for other students, physical activities like sports and gym or music 
or science or coding, et cetera, are passions that spark the greatest engagement. These are areas that one size fits all types of data does not capture. I urge the board to be critical of our district's intense attachment to test data as the driving force of our understanding of how we're doing in all of this and to be wary of the negative effects that too much acceleration can have during a time of continued stress and adaptation for both our teachers and students. This is a vital time for us to re-examine how we partner with our families, how we see our students as individuals, how we increase teacher agency, and how we build back school communities that can truly thrive in the future. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, the next public comment is from Seth Rosenblum. My daughter, my daughter attends ninth grade at Albany High School. I would like to thank the board and the district staff for reopening school. In one week, she has become a completely different person with renewed joy over little interactions with friends, new and old. There is also a sense of renewed academic motivation from connecting with teachers in person. Her experience highlights for me that having our kids in a hybrid learning model is not enough. The research is becoming clear that even pre-vaccination, the risks of COVID to children are minor. We all know that our students in Albany face many challenges that are outside the control of the teachers, administration, and the school board. And we put tremendous resources as a community into trying to give our children a better future. Fully reopening schools for all grades is something that's clearly going to benefit our children and it's squarely in the district's control. Please help us promote the mental health and academic achievement of our youth by focusing harder. You achieve something that would have seemed impossible in switching to a remote learning model. It is now time to navigate the financial, regulatory, and political hurdles, excuse me, hurdles, to getting all students back full time with a sense of urgency and an eye toward swift action. Okay, and the final uh, public comment that we have uh, was submitted by Tina Snide. I am a parent of two children that attend the Albany City Schools. My 13-year-old attends St Stephen and Harriet Myers Middle School, and my 10-year-old attends Albany School of Humanities. For the past two years, it has been a struggle with transportation and first student to get any help with my children getting the bus on time and being dropped off at a decent time. My 13-year-old has an IEP due to a cancer diagnosis, and my 10-year-old has a 504 plan also due to a medical condition. I have begged and pleaded to get something done with transportation. Still nothing is being done about this. Please help me with this. So I think that's the end of our written public comment, and we do have no in-person comment tonight. I want to add that that last comment that was read um, came in quite a few days ago, and I know that since then the Transportation Department has been in touch with them, and I believe are making progress towards a resolution on that. So I just want everybody to know um, that that had happened. Um, we always appreciate all public comments, and we find hearing from community members so valuable. We really ask you um, out in the world to feel free to reach out to us. Our contact information for public comments and for routine correspondence is at albanyschools.org forward slash BOE. That brings us now to the part of our meeting we call routine consent. During this portion of the meeting, we approve routine matters for the district. These include items like contracts, personnel matters, and the like. Each board member reviews each item carefully, but we vote on them as a group with no discussion. That allows us to use our meeting time more efficiently. Nonetheless, each board member has the option to set aside any routine consent item in order to require a separate discussion and vote on that item. With that introduction, I will now entertain a motion to adopt the routine consent agenda. Motion by Vice President Smith, second by Board Member Krejci. Are there any set-asides? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the routine consent agenda in its entirety? That is unanimous. And that brings us now to the uh, only action I believe that we'll be taking tonight, which is um, actions on some policies we discussed last time. Dr. Chatur. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. We have four policies that we have to act on today. First one is 0101, gender neutral single occupancy bathrooms. Second one is 1500 public use of facilities. 4511, textbook selection and 2210 board organizational meeting. We discussed them last time. Uh, if there are any questions? If not, we have a motion. I'm sorry, I lost track of what was going on. 
because I was distracted. Uh, but I am now focused. Are we going to take these all at once, or you want to do them one at a time? Yeah, let's, do one, let's do all of them at once. Do them all at once. Is there, there any, any reason, board colleagues? Are there any reasons that we? Is there any reason not to do them all at once? Okay. Go. So, all in favor of a motion? Did you already take the motion? No. no okay. Motion by uh, Ms. Krejci, second by Ms. Wilson. All in favor of adopting these four motions? Uh, four. Policies that is unanimous, and Thank I am you. now focused. Sorry about that. I lost it for a minute there, but I'm back. Um, that is the end of our action agenda. As I think we all know, we generally try and front load all of our actions at the beginning of the me meeting so that those who come for public comment see all of the actions. We will now move on to the discussion portion of our agenda. Well, it is possible that we will take an action. We generally do not do that after this point in the meeting, and we are going to turn now to the 2021 budget and um, have a review of the presentation that the community, that the um, superintendent, deputy superintendent are generally using in their community meetings um, so that we can get a sense of how that um, translates from what we talk about to how it's talked about to the community. Superintendent Adams. Thank you so very much, Madam President and members of the board. So this is information that you have seen before, but we have restructured it a little bit uh, because this is what we are using as we are doing our community presentations. And um, we have also extended this to our PTA so that if they are having meetings, we are more than happy to come and share this information. So again, we start with our guiding principles, our vision, mission, and goals to make sure that the decisions that we are making align with those vision, mission, and goals. Our discussion topics are the budget proposal. This is what the voters will consider on May 18th, the instructional planning for the 21-22 school year, our one-time federal funds, our Sarissa funds, and the ARP funds, um, important additional funds separate from the budget proposal, the information for our voters, and then what happens if the budget is not approved. So when we first start out with looking at strategically rebuilding staff and programming uh, from the effects of COVID-19, we looked at what would it take to rebuild and accelerate learning. And so when we do that, we're talking about investing our state and federal funds to maintain our current staffing programs. We are looking at different structures as to, in terms of how we deliver instruction. And then one of the things that we really have to highlight is the social and emotional supports for our students and making sure that we have the programs in place for that. Um, you will see throughout the presentation um, modifications to the 21-22 curriculum to teach into the standards that are not yet mastered and then integrating technology within our instructional program and then ensuring that we have those wraparound services for our students. So what does the proposed budget support? And I, I want to go through these. Uh, we have a couple of slides that talk about what's in the budget already. And I think it's important to understand that these are the things that are included in the budget as we move forward and propose the budget. So we know that we had a significant reduction of staff. And we have brought back 180 of those positions. And then I'll show you a little bit later with the ratios uh, slide in terms of even though we are down by 100 students from where we started this year, we are still looking at that staffing. It is slightly increased to support our students. We are looking at the restoration of the Albany International Center as a standalone. We're also looking at the restoration of the Tony Clement Center for Education as a standalone, moving our sixth grade students to the middle school. Um, the permanent feeder pattern for the 22, 23 and beyond will be developed. That's the facilities committee. So thank you so very much um, for that. Um, we are ready to move forward with establishing that committee so that we can get our community input. Moving our eighth grade students at O'Neill to North Albany Middle School, restoring the athletic component that was reduced earlier in the year, our ninth grade boys and girls basketball, ninth grade basketball, I'm sorry, ninth grade baseball and modified boys soccer. You're going to hear a common theme with social and emotional supports. And if you go back and look at some of the positions that we've added in, you will see that we have really looked at that in terms of behavioral specialists, social workers, et cetera. The instructional intervention positions, you can go back and look at the positions that we have brought back, really focus on mathematics, reading, and ELA. 
Uh, the other pieces that we know are in the proposed budget are full day pre-K because we know how important our early learning is for our students. Um, our magnet programs will maintain, but relocating dual language to 50 North Lark, which is currently O'Neill. And it is also going to be co-located co with the Albany International Center. Our community schools, we're still maintaining that. Um, we have not lost that funding for our community schools. And so we look at continuing with that and um, looking at the strategic use of those funds that goes to that goes to those particular schools. Band chorus orchestra starting at the elementary level um, with the additional positions in the budget. Uh, this includes third grade. It is in response to the request from the last meeting where the board requested that we go back and we look at what are some of the options that we would be able to provide. And so we are working, we will begin working with our teachers. We've been working administratively on what some of the research says and what we can do at the third grade level. And so we will begin those meetings with our teachers to see what we can develop and what that instruction would look like. And so we've taken that very seriously as we move forward Albany Marching Falcon Band and Color Guard. We're also looking at maintaining and um, encouraging more of our students and building that pathway for our advanced courses, our AP, IB, University in the high school, um, our CTE pathway. We know that we have a very strong CTE program. And so we're not looking to lose any of that. We're looking to encourage our students to be a part of that our average college uh, and career readiness programs. I will put one program that is not listed here, but we know that it is extremely important to the success of our students for those students who choose to be engaged is our ROTC program. So we know that that is also a program that we want to maintain at the high school as well. Our theater program, the culturally relevant teaching and learning practices with our emphasis on equity and where we are with the actualization of equity in our practices and our student voice and how we continue to foster student voice within the social justice concerns that are in our society, but also that our students face every day. And then the restorative practices. So these are the things that are in the proposed budget. And then the next slide does show what I mentioned earlier with regard to the staffing. And so this budget proposal restores our staffing to where we were at the beginning of this year. And you can see that we are approximately 100 students greater than where we were at the onset of the school. I'm sorry, our student population, our enrollment is down about 100 students from where we were at the beginning of the year. But you can see that our staffing is slightly increasing in the areas of our teacher area and our support staff areas so that that direct support for students is being provided. In the instructional planning, uh, this is very uh, similar to what I shared earlier. Uh, we're looking at the full in-person model based on the guidance, in-person and hybrid models similar to what we're doing now in the fourth quarter, and then the additional virtual option. Of course, it is pending the state education department, but we are still looking at maintaining that particular program provided um, nothing out of the ordinary, if we could even say what the ordinary is, provided out of the ordinary happens. The next slide, we talked about that earlier this evening, and that provides the community transmission rates. And then the same chart that we looked at earlier with regard to the uh, breakdown of what that looks like for the fall instructional program with regard to being in person or if there are hybrid options based on the building capacity. At this time, I'll turn it over to Ms. Roaring, our Deputy Superintendent. Thank you, Superintendent Adams. I'm reviewing our revenue and expenditure projections for next year in the proposed budget. We have this demonstrated here in a pie chart. Um, I wanna highlight on the revenue side, the yellow and light blue represents roughly 88% of our revenue, and that is from state aid other than building aid and our property taxes. On the, on the right hand side, you'll see the estimated expenditures and that blue is our instructional program, which represents 80% of our spending. When we look at our proposed revenue over the last uh, two years and our proposed revenue for next year, uh, we will see that our federal aid 
is decreasing. Mm -hmm. All right, so overall our, our revenue is uh, up about $8.7 million. We have in here the 0.95% tax levy increase of 1.1 million and are reflecting a state aid increase here of 1.14 million. It's not me. Looking at our proposed expenditures, our program budget is up about $8 million year over year. This reflects a $6.4 million investment in instruction, as well as $1.6 million increase in charter school tuition. Our capital or operations and maintenance area of the budget includes a slight increase in our maintenance and operation uh, budget, as well as $1.3 million increase in our debt service which is associated with bringing on additional capital projects. We'll start the North Albany Middle School project this month, and we will be starting the five-year plan late June, early July. Lastly, our administrative budget reflects a decrease of 945,000 for that year-over-year -year change of just under 8.7 million. When we look at our start of 2021 and where we are now in proposing 21-22, we started out at 261.5 million and last fall made some decisions to reduce uh, personnel in other areas of the budget by 14.7 million. We have brought back 180 positions. Um, and we've also had some additional increases in health insurance, our contractual salary increases, uh, debt service, charter schools, and overall showing a proposed budget for next year of 270.2 million. Looking at the eight year tax levy history, we had three years, including next year, where the, we are proposing less than a 1% tax levy increase. In this eight year history, we also had two years at 0%. In 2019 20 and in 2021, we had tax levy proposals of just under 2%. This brings the eight year average to 1.01. .01. These modest annual tax levy increases support long term fiscal planning and stability for the district that allows us to sustain the programs for our students over time. 80% of our annual budget is for our instructional program. We are addressing rising costs in healthcare of about 10% each year. <clears throat> and in a typical year, 88% of our school district revenue does come from state aid and property taxes. So what would this 0.95% tax levy increase look like for homeowners? These are estimated numbers for next year the estimated change would be anywhere from $31 to $49 for the year on an assessed value of $150,000. This is dependent on participation in the STAR program and whether or not it's a basic or enhanced STAR. The district will also receive one-time federal funds. The SARISA funds were approved in December and we are anticipating an allocation of 13.5 million based on the state aid runs from April. These funds are available to the district to use until September 23. The American Recovery Plan was approved in March and based on our state aid run, we are anticipating an allocation of $32.8 million and these funds are available through September 24. These funds do require a community engagement process and we're committed to providing opportunities for the community to provide input on that. So we will be looking at forums in late May and early June as we work through that process. It's important to note that there's no additional impact on taxes associated with either of these federal funds. So some of our planned new investments for 21-22 using these funds include expanding the Albany International Center to be a K-12 program, expanding dual language to offer two sections, enhancing summer school and after school programming, increasing our music staffing above our 2019-20 levels, restoring our instrumental music opportunities in third grade, supporting additional instrumental music lessons for grades four through six, digital tools to support and accelerate our learning, HVAC and ventilation system enhancements, as well as technology, hardware, and establishing the virtual academy if permitted. Tomorrow, we will be sending out the budget newsletter to all of our residents to provide additional details and information on the budget. We have a virtual community budget presentation scheduled on May 11th at 6 p.m. We will be with Common Council presenting to them on May 12th at 5.30 p.m. And our budget vote is on May 18th. And we are returning to in-person voting. So oh, let's turn it back over. 
with regard to our Board of Education election, we have two Board, edu board of Education seats up for election on May 18th. Both incumbent positions are seeking re-election. Vice President Vicki Smith and Board Member Dr. Shradar Shatur. You can get more information at albanyschools.org slash BOE. We also know that on our ballot, you will also see the Albany Public Library information. In addition to the school-related items, on May 18th, two seats on the Albany Public Library Board of Trustees are also up for election, but there is one candidate. Gerard Gauss will be on that ballot, and then there would be space for write-ins. Uh, no library budget vote this year since there's no tax levy increase proposed. And for more information about the library, please call Stephanie Simon at 518-708-3912. And more information may be found at albanypubliclibrary.org. Information for our voters, in per, we are voting in person at 15 locations citywide. Our polls will open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. We are following the COVID guidelines with regard to the in-person voting. There's one new voting location this year, the Italian American Community Center. And absentee voting, the there are additional, there's an additional option in that the state will allow concerns regarding potential exposure to COVID-19 as a reason for requesting an absentee ballot. More information may be found at albanyschools.org slash budget. Ms. Rory. So what happens if the budget is not approved on May 18th? The Board of Education has three options. Put up the same proposal for another vote in June, present a revised budget for voter consideration in June, or adopt a contingency budget. If a vote fails twice, the district would operate under a contingency budget. Mm -hmm. This may require cuts in specific areas, including potential cuts to staffing and programs. It prohibits any spending on student supplies and requires community groups to pay for the use of our school facilities. At this time, we will open uh, for, we're open for questions. So I know there won't be a whole lot of questions because we talked about this budget extensively before we actually adopted it on April 22nd, but I think it's um, always a good idea to give board members a chance to reflect or comment on the way it's being presented to the community. I was able to join the superintendent and the deputy superintendent last night at the Council of Albany Neighborhood Associations um, meeting where we did get a, a quite good res response um, and it was great to have some questions. I would say most of the questions were around um, the relocation of the dual program and around uh, changes in music. So I think those were the, the two things that came up um, the most in that group. And there were probably 30, 30 folks. Um, so it was, it was a nice group. So any comments or questions for the superintendent? Board Member Krejci. Uh, yes, I did. I did have a question about the instrumental music program at the third at the third grade level, and mm -hmm. it sounded like you said that there would be changes uh, to, I guess I would say the pre-existing third grade program, such as existed through 1920. Can you provide more information on that? So one of the things that we are looking at is um, what that program looks like, uh, because it does include. Uh, looking at band orchestra chorus at that level. And so there are some considerations with regard to band at the third grade. And those are the things that we're looking at. There are different instruments. There may be select instruments that students are using. We're looking at the, um, there are some instruments that are, uh, and I have to review some of that research that has been provided. Um, there are some instruments that are plastic or a little lightweight that students could participate in. And so we may have to look at purchasing some of those types of instruments. So it's, it's more than just saying yes, it's saying yes and what do we need? And so we're in the process right now, we've done the research administratively. And so over the next few weeks, we will be engaging the teachers at that level with regard to what's needed so that we can see what that looks like. Okay, I just wanna encourage, you know, share my own perspective that that I, I hope that instrumental access will be equitable among the elementary schools because that's just so critically important to building yeah, strong actually, it's interesting programs in the future. It's interesting that you should mention that because one of the things I haven't had a chance to send you guys, I was going to send you my notes. I re-listened to the two, maybe three, two, I listened to for sure, presentations from the Music Equity Task Force. And I know that was one of the things on the action list, which again, I'm not asking for a presentation on this now, but we do need to get back to it. 
um, which was the possibility of consolidating and making it a sort of a district set of musical instruments so that they could be distributed more equitably because there are definitely inequities between the schools in terms of instrument availability. Um, okay, so I, are, we, are we good on music? So it sounds like the question is, uh, to be worked out with the music teachers, what is the best way to implement third grade band um, and orchestra instrumental music? Yeah. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Oh, thank you. All right. Anything else on the budget? Otherwise, you know, I feel like it's a relatively clear presentation for a very complicated budget, much more complex than our, no our normal budget because of these um, one-time funds. And I felt that the community members really felt that they could understand what was what was happening overall. We do invite members of the community who have questions to reach out to us. Um, we are welcome. You can ask us questions by email and we will respond. Or you can invite us to come and give you a presentation if you have a, you know, a small group that you would like to do. Um, plus there's, as I think was on the slides, the virtual community forum. Um, coming up next Tuesday, which the district hosts, is another opportunity for people to um, to ask their questions. So, are we ready to move on beyond the budget? Okay, next topic: uh, the Albany High graduation report. This is actually from last school year, so we're almost. You know, they don't. SED doesn't release the graduation information until February, almost March. And then I believe the agenda setting committee pushed it a couple of times because we were, we are always trying to make sure our committee, our board meetings don't go too long. Thus, we were having it a little bit later than we normally do. Superintendent Epp. So at this time, I will turn it over to Ms. Lori McKenna, our assistant superintendent for secondary instruction. So thank you, Ms. McKenna. Good, Good evening, evening everyone. everyone. Uh, President, uh, President Savage, Savage Superintendent Adams, Adams board, board members and community. community. I'm honored to be here with Principal Comerford and presenting the graduation rate data tonight. But before we jump into the presentation, I just want to acknowledge and thank Ms. Comerford and her team, as well as the district leaders for their collective efforts and leadership in increasing our graduation uh, rate year after year. And we know that it doesn't happen by accident. So. Huge shout out to uh, Ms. Comerford, uh, her team, and again, our district leaders who have supported the efforts um, in increasing our graduation rate. So what this slide shows us, um, and this is a slide that I review um, year um, after year, these there are several business rules that are applied to our graduation rate each year for both the high school and the district, which includes our students who are in out of district placements. And so this year's data represents our 2016 cohort four year um, June and August graduate graduates, as well as our 2015 cohort uh, five year June and 2014 cohort six year June. I won't read this slide um, to you, um, but you can see that um, there are very specific uh, business rules that are applied as they um, calculate our graduation rate for um, the different cohorts. Next slide, please. For our 2016 cohort, as you can see, we had a 70% district and a 72% Albany High School June graduation rate, and a 71% district and 73% Albany High School graduation rate. The August data rate uh, data includes both the June and August graduates cumulative. The next slide represents um, the breakdown of the total cohort the number of graduates, the type of di diplomas earned, as well as dropouts and students still enrolled for both the district and Albany High School. On this slide, you can see that this data set represents the same 2016 cohort, including the number of graduates, the type of diplomas earned, as well as dropouts and students still enrolled for the district. The difference with this is that it shows the cohort disaggregated by the accountability um, subgroups um, under um, ESSA. Again, similar to the last slide, this data also represents the same 2016 cohort, including the number of graduates, the types of diplomas earned, as well as dropout and students still enrolled for Albany High School. Again, um, the difference um, is the disaggregation of our accountability subgroups. Um, the next slide um, focuses on the four-year trend by subgroup, 
And here you can see the graduation trend for the past four years, which is also broken down by cohort. What you can see is that we have increased our graduation rate by 10% from June of 2017 to June of 2020, and 9% for from August 2016 to August of 2020 at Albany High School. This also shows a steady increase in our subgroups as well. Um, the Albany High School three year trend by trend subgroup June. Um, this is a graphical representation of the Albany High School's June three year trend by subgroup with an overlay of state um, rate trend with a state rate trend line. Say that five times quickly. Um, this shows more clearly the consistent increase of many of our subgroups, including students with disabilities, English language learners, and many of our um, race subgroups, including our black and Hispanic subgroups. Um, the next slide uh, is very similar, except for um, our August. Um, and this is the same graphic. Um, we see consistent internal gains with most subgroups that are proportional to state trends in terms of the percentage increase. The next slide, Albany High three-year trend by diploma type for June. This is a graphical representation showing Albany High's three-year uh, trend by, di by diploma type. Uh, while we continue to see an increase in our graduation rate year over year, as you can see, there is no real conclusion other than we have a higher rate of dropouts and students still enrolled. Um, same thing as the previous slide, except for August, uh, similar to June, while we continue to see an increase in our graduation rate year over year, again, there's no real conclusion other than we have a higher rate of dropouts and students still enrolled for our August graduates. Um, this next slide um, really um, presents um, the entire cohort. And really what I want to focus on here is what really happened to the rest of our 26 cohort. Um, this shows that out of the 722 students in the 2016 uh, cohort, there are still 103 students enrolled and, um, and 88 students who had dropped out. For Albany High specifically, out of the 697 students in the cohort, 95 are still enrolled and 85 have dropped out. The remaining students um, that I didn't mention have either graduated or transferred to a GED program. Um, as you look at the four-year graduation rate by cohort um, on this slide, you can see that we continue to increase the graduation rate at both the district and building level. Um, a 6% increase for both the June and um, August um, um, from 2014 to 2016 cohort. So again, moving in that, that positive direction. Um, our final data slide um, represents our five and six year graduation rate. And for accountability purposes, this um, data is included. Um, these are our students who need more time to earn their high school credentials in five or six years. And as you can as you can see on this slide, as we continue to provide the wraparound instructional and social emotional supports to our students needing more time in school, it's resulting in an increase in our five and six year graduation rate, both at the district and the building level. So in conclusion, before I get um, to the last slide, the data shared tonight, um, and I mentioned this earlier, was a result of a lot of effort and strategic planning through our SEP process at Albany High School under the leadership of Principal Comerford. And so I'm going to turn it over to her at this point um, to share with us uh, the initiatives that are in place to support our graduation rate efforts and the continued upward trajectory. Principal Comerford? Thank you, Ms. McKenna. You're welcome. Albany High School is very proud of the systems we've built to increase our graduation rate and ensure our students graduate career and college ready. Much of this is accomplished by our MTSS teams. We have several MTSS teams at the high school. We have our academy teams, ENL, special ed, and night school. This work has contributed to our graduation rate increasing annually. Many students, uh, student supports our outcomes from the MTSS meetings. Um, these include case manager assignment, student and uh, student parent and teacher meetings, 
and home visits. Our administrative team's collaboration with our content area supervisors and supporting teachers and common planning teams ensures we continue in to increase the content area skills of our seniors and um, all of our students actually. Our academy principals hold weekly meetings with the guidance counselors to review senior progress. They're closely monitoring individual students and overall academy graduation rates. We also continue outreach to um, students who have dropped out that Ms. McKenna had mentioned. Um, and we do this four times a year. Um, we start that work in the summer. We revisit again in the fall, um, then again in the winter, and then again in the spring and the cycle starts again. So we're, we're continually trying to get um, seniors back who um, have the eligibility to meet their graduation requirements. Then we have, um, in addition to our academic supports, we hold uh, senior assemblies to discuss graduation progress. And we, we do those in all sorts of ways. Um, sometimes they're just on focus students. Sometimes they are larger with um, you know, whole senior classes. Um, and then we even do smaller um, academy ones throughout the school year. We have several options for our seniors. Um, for success, including smaller um, environments, utilizing um, the Clemens Center, night school, APEX, our credit recovery program, and tutoring. Another major initiative uh, is to increase student attendance. And our attendance committee closely monitors senior attendance and works with our academy teams to support uh, attendance initiatives, such as you see here, Saturate the Streets, in which we um, send out large groups of um, support staff to complete and, and principals to complete home visits to our seniors. If seniors are unable to meet their graduation requirements, we will continue them in summer school. And then finally, with um, COVID, the Regents exemptions have positively impacted us, um, increasing our graduation rates. On uh, normal Regents years, we do offer a Regents review for, for those students. Um, most of the Regents review this year for students who um, are opting in to take those um, is done right in their, their classrooms. So we look forward to our school continuing our efforts to succeed in increasing our graduation rate. And we will now open it up to questions. Board colleagues, comments or questions? Dr. Chatur. A 10% increase over four years, that's no joke. I mean, that's seriously great job. On slide you. five, you break out the different subgroups. Two things that stand out to me in the dropout section are the ELLs and the Hispanic subgroup. It's 20% dropout, 30% dropout. Um, what is it that we're planning to do for next year? I mean, I know that we're, you know, the expanding the AIC, the dual program, all of these things. What are the things are we doing to make sure we can stem that dropout rate in those two subgroups specifically? I mean, everybody is increasing graduation, but when you look at that dropout rate, it's like those two just stand out. They're alarming. So the the ENL MTSS team is new this year. Um, we recognize that, and um, through our collaboration with our um, district supervisors. Um, and the set planning that we do with all of um, our building administrators and the district supervisors um, that came out of uh, that planning this year. So um, we're hoping to see an increase there with uh, a more laser like focus for um, our ENL students and all of our subgroups. So that is being monitored closely and that that team um, has been supporting students. Um, a lot of the AIC supports are um, literally located at the, the, the high school um, and pushing in. And um, we were able to really kind of build like a hallway where all of those teachers are at the high school this year. Um, so that, you know, while we don't have the actual building for the AIC, we do have the same supports built into um, the high school. So um, I am hoping that the monitoring of that this year will, will help us increase those rates for those groups. Anyone else with a comment or question? Board Member Elmanelli. To echo, echo Dr. Chatur's uh, comments, I'm I'm impressed, but I'm also a little bit upset about the um, ELLs 
uh, graduation rate. And I also wanted to kind of bring up the still enrolled group. Um, if, if we're breaking these down, the still enrolled has, if I'm not mistaken, still has the opportunity to graduate. So, I mean, when, when you look at that, we have a potential of 84 85% graduation rate. So that's, it's good. Um, I want to, I want us to focus on the ELLs and those that are still enrolled, whether it's by encouraging them to seek different programming in high school um, or, you know, going down the, uh, the GED route, uh, we've got, we've got to get those numbers higher. And I think if we do, we would end up matching the state averages. So it's less of a question, just more of a comment. Yeah, and I'd like to build on um, uh, Ms. Comerford's um, response to the last question. And I do want to just make note or point out that um, many of our L's, when they come to us in high school, come to us at 17, 18, 19 years old with no credits. And so they age out before they can actually graduate, which then they, they count towards our dropout rate. So that's a critical piece of information um, that we need to keep in mind. And um, if you remember a few weeks ago when uh, Mr. Gilio and uh, Ms. Stead spoke about this ENL transition uh, teacher for our 18 through 21 year olds, um, that's the very reason that um, we need that uh, position desperately to uh, reach um, those kiddos who may age out before they can actually receive the credits for graduation. And if I could just add the, um when I was talking about the four times a year where we're reaching out, that is not just to um, students who have dropped out. That is also to um, students who are still enrolled. So that that is continuously occurring throughout the school year. Another thing I just want to point out to my colleagues, you guys know I love my spreadsheets and I really obsess about all these numbers. And one of the things to really keep in mind about that L number is that the cohort size is really small. It's like, um, as you look back, this year's cohort was like 70 kids, but going back, it's been as few as 40. So it's like 40 to 70 is sort of the range. So when the cohort is that small, one or two kids can make choom, a huge change in the um, graduation rate. So I want you to keep that in mind for any cohort um, that has a very small N. Um, and that is especially true of our of our ELLs and our um, also our special education student um, numbers tend to be low like that. The big cohorts um, like our white graduation rate and our black graduation rate, um, I find more compelling and more meaningful because we know that those cohorts are hundreds of students, so they're not as um, impacted. And so I'll just use that that as a segue to um, to really compliment you guys on the um, closing of what I, I like to think of as the opportunity gap. Um, one of the things I do very every time the numbers come out is I subtract the black graduation rate from the white graduation rate and figure out where what's the difference. And this is the smallest it has ever been. Um, and I have the data going back in just my personal spreadsheet, like maybe eight or nine years. And we're down to I think it was this year. I think the difference is like nine percent, um, which is the smallest it has ever been, which means that we are living our intention around equitably distributing our resources and focusing on what every single child needs to try and make sure that there is not an opportunity gap in the Albany City School District. So I really commend you for that work that's obviously having direct results. So thank you. If I could just add, I, I just noticed um, we are actually at the same, we are at the state average for the L's. Um, as of 2020, so it was 46 this year. But I, I, I warn you, if it goes down next year, it's not a trend. It's just because one kid, right. something happened to them. So you just have to really, you cannot those those they swing wildly um, because of the small small cohort. So I'm going back to complimenting you guys, and I want you guys to hear that, and I want to hear you say thank you for my compliment because I want to stay on that positive vibe. I really appreciate that. Thank okay. you. I, I was going I to say thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much for the prompting, but I was going to say thank you very much because I also think what is important to note is that um, one of the pieces of information that I have 
uh, watch very carefully is how many of our students need a waiver for graduation. And over the past few years, that number has become fewer and fewer. And of course, with the waiver, I was very concerned about how many of our students that were graduating would be impacted by that. And so last year, and I know that we reported it out, but I just think it's worth it to call the attention to the fact that only, and I don't want to say only meaning like minimizing it, but when you think in terms of our graduation, over 500 students, 28% of them needed the waiver. The other larger percentage of our graduates were on target for graduating without the waiver. And I think that's something that's really important to note because that's not just, you know, as I say, I only have two hands. That's not just one person. That's the work of the teachers, support staff, administrators, everybody working together and pulling for our students and making sure that they're coming to school, making sure that they're in their classes and while we understand the work that goes into it, I think it's really, um, it just speaks to who we are. When you look at the number of home visits that our folks are doing at all levels um, to ensure the success of our students, and sometimes I believe that that gets lost. And I just want to highlight that because um, when we are reaching out individually and and it's what else can we do? It's whatever else we need to do. And so I do want to say uh, my hat goes off to Ms. Comerford, the entire faculty and staff at Albany High, the leadership under Ms. McKenna, the support of cabinet, um, as well as my support, but also just recognizing the work that goes into attaining a 73% graduation rate when you look at in 2016-17, we were at 64% graduation rate. And that is outstanding work and commitment. So thank you so very much. And I just want to add on that, in fact, the graduation rate was considerably lower prior to that, right? Our, I mean, when we hit the we bottom, we were at 54% graduation rate, right? So we have, come, and that's not, that's not decades ago. That was the graduation rate in 2014. So we have brought our graduation rate up like 20% points in just a, a handful of years. So it really does show, um, and I don't mean to be Pollyanna, I know there's still plenty of work to do, and I know that that work continues, but I do think that this is this is one of those times to really also recognize as the superintendent has the hard work that has made it possible to get us those numbers. Um, I didn't mean to monopolize the conversation, but I really am, am so pleased and proud to have been a part of this mm -hmm. effort. Anyone else with commentary or question? Ms. Smith. Thank you both so much. Yeah, thank you, and I, I just wanted to add uh, thank my thanks as well. I think, um, and Superintendent, I really appreciate what you just point out at, pointed out around the waiver, um, because I think, you know, uh, I think uh, the, some public impression was, was that, oh, great, all these kids are going to be uh, permitted waivers, and that just, like, destroys any understanding or sense of, you know, what graduation rate really means. And I think this number uh, shows that our kids were learning, are learning, you know, still, mm -hmm. are we trying to make drastic improvements and make sure that it's robust and all of that stuff? Yes, but they were learning and they were able to do this mm -hmm. on their own two feet and with the support of uh, great staff and teachers. So I, I really wanted to commend the staff as well. I also uh, likewise think that um, the work that's been going on uh, to connect with our youngsters, um, the home visits, the uh, probably remote, uh, like come into my office calls and things like that have been very, uh, I think, important this year and really speak to a tremendous amount of work. And I just wanted to not only say kudos here to the high school, but also to um, Principal Sanchez Gale, who mm -hmm. specifically talked about the steps that her team uh, her school team were using and utilizing to connect with youngsters. And so it's great to hear that consistency uh, throughout the district uh, and in all of our schools. So again, thank you all. Board Member Mann. I too wanted to say thank you. And I, I wanted to give a nod to my profession around home visits. Um, and 
I, I was really struck in this presentation by um, all the different, just the variety of initiatives that we do have, ways that we can connect with our kids and our families, and um, and for, for you know, it's a uh, it, it is kind of a source of pride for me, you know, when I when I when I have seen over a very short period of time the high school rate um, increase. And so, thank you, and thank you for all of your hard work. Ms. Smith. I'm sorry, and just one more comment on that note. Um, and, and these gems, it's not that we were not doing these, uh, implementing these strategies before, but I think that the difference is there was the pandemic, of course, but some really in the work around equity um, and some deliberate purposefulness in reaching out to our youngsters. So I don't want, and I, I'm certain that you're on the same page, we don't want to lose that even when we return back to quote, you know, normalcy, right? Um, there's just some very significant gems, um, you know, shining moments that I think we uh, are all learning from as a society and have to keep in place um, to make sure that our youngsters are successful. Thank you. Any further comments or questions on the graduation rate? I will also just add a last commendation on the six-year rate. Uh, that is a rate I watch very carefully because I'm well aware of the fact that our children um, in the City School District of Albany, as in other high-need school districts, um, have complicated lives. And those complicated lives um, may not allow them to graduate in four years. And honestly, I'm more proud of the folks who graduate at six than I am at four because it means you really stuck it out and you figured out a way to make something happen that was not easy and was not guaranteed. And I noticed that the graduation, that the six-year graduation rate continues to rise as well. Um, and so, you know, when I see that six-year graduation rate and it's four or five points higher than the graduation rate was two years prior, I know that that's like 40 kids who are now credentialed and ready to move forward in their lives um, in a way that they wouldn't have been if um, if they hadn't had that opportunity to get that graduation done. So I know the state insists on focusing on that four year rate and I understand why they want that. But I also know that um, it's it's easy to think four years is the only way. But there are there's there's a lot going into that six year rate. Okay, shall we move off of graduation rate? We're going to have new graduates to celebrate in just around the corner, and we look forward to that. All right, what does that bring us to? What's next? Summer, Summer school. Summer school. And so we will have Dr. Cecily Wilson-Turner and our assistant superintendent for elementary instruction and Ms. Lori McKenna for the, assist, the assistant superintendent for secondary instruction to talk to us about Summer School 2021. Thank you. Good evening. I will open the presentation um, once it's presented. So tonight, Ms. McKenna and I will provide an overview of our summer school academic programs for the 2021 <clears throat> summer. Uh, we are looking to have six programs again this year at eight school sites. Um, we provide breakfast, lunch, and transportation at both the elementary and the middle school and high school level. Um, our budget this year is just over $2.5 million, <clears throat> with over $800,000 coming out of grants. Um, but the bulk of our summer school um, efforts this year sit in the um, American Recovery Plan Act funds. This is a breakdown that we try to provide every year, so the uh, board and the public have a sense of how the funding breaks down. So the grants that are referred to in the previous slide are from Title III, which support our ENL program primarily, and ESY, which support our <clears throat> um, extended school year summer programming for our special education students. Um, we also have grants that are um, part of our after school program that are extended through summer, and that is the Empire State After School Program, which funds after school programming at uh, eight of our schools and thus offers extended school years for those students in the, in the summer and 21st Century, um, <clears throat> which also runs programming in four of our schools, excuse me, five of our schools, um, and offers extended programming in the summer. And then every program um, except DSY also is being funded through the American Recovery Plan Act funds. So our eight program, our six programs, excuse me, um, are our pre-kindergarten jumpstart, our elementary school enrichment program, middle school, high school, summer school, our newcomer program, and our extended school year program. 
Our Jumpstart program traditionally starts a little bit later in the summer um, in an effort to <clears throat> better prepare students for their entry into kindergarten closer to the start of that time. Um, it is a half day program that runs from 8 a.m. to 1230 and will seat approximately 60 students this year. They will co-locate with the um, elementary summer school programs at Pine Hills and Schuyler Achievement Academy and focus their efforts on school readiness for students. Um, Ms. Hasty believes very strongly in the social emotional development of students as well as the um, academic preparedness for students so that they are ready for what occurs um, as they enter into kindergarten. <clears throat> The metrics as listed below will focus on ELA math readiness as well as qualitative social emotional assessments. And again, the primary funding source for the just under $80,000 cost of this program is the American Rescue Plan Act. The elementary program um, will run from July 6th through August 13th this school year. Um, <clears throat> and it is our, this summer and it is a full day program, um, Monday through Friday. Um, that is a, a combination of academics in the morning and enrichment in the afternoon for our on-site programs. Our virtual programs will be um, just a morning academic offering, and we will offer our enrichment, the enrichment website um, that was shared with BOCES last year to provide families opportunities to provide additional enrichment. <clears throat> and our in-person programs will be located at Pine Hills, New Scotland, and Philip, Philip Schuyler Achievement Academy. Our aim is to serve 630 students <clears throat> and to preset those students for a stronger academic start and social emotional start to the school year. It really is a pickup of where we left off last summer um, with reshaping our summer program <clears throat> to include the academic and social emotional learning as well as STEM and social studies opportunities. We are grateful, however, this year that we can have a fully separate virtual program for that, for that when that works for families, but also a fully integrated academic program um, in person where students <clears throat> have the academic experience and the enrichment experience with our providers from the YMCA and Boys and Girls Club. We are in development right now with um, 15 Love, who is uh, who reached out to us to ensure that they could offer um, this year a tennis program at each of our in-person sites. And so we look forward to offering that enrichment opportunity for our students this year. We are also in in development with providing um, musical instrumental music um, enrichment in the afternoon for the um, elementary academic summer program as those students wouldn't be involved in the other music program that is occurring throughout the summer to provide another pass for students to get reacclimated or introduced to instrumental music in preparation for um, the coming school year. Our metrics will remain consistent. We will utilize the Math Navigator program and Alexia. And then as always, we will hopefully have our fall administration of the NWEA um, that allows us to kind of, of compare those students who attended summer school and those who did not and what the impact of summer school was as a result. As previously indicated, our funding sources are the 21st Century Learning Grant, the Empire State After School Program, and the American Rescue Plan Act funding for a total budget of just over $1.03 million. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Ms. McKenna for the secondary programs. Thanks, Dr. Wilson-Turner. So at the middle school um, this summer, we will offer an in-person and virtual summer school opportunity for our middle school students in grades six through eight. Um, the program will run through from July 6th through August 6th at Myers Middle School. Students who will be in, pers will be in person from 8.30 to 11.30, which will also include breakfast and lunch for our on-site kiddos. Our virtual students will also be in session virtually from 8.30 to 11.30. And you'll notice um, that we have increased our capacity by approximately 175 students this year um, due to the increase in the number of students who have demonstrated unfinished learning at the end of um, quarter four. So this means that um, students will be uh, invited to participate um, if they are in grades six through eight and did not experience success um, and failed two or more core classes um, this year. Students participating in uh, the middle school summer school program will receive additional support and instruction in the four core classes, ELA, math, science, and social studies, as well as PE and social emotional learning. Our goal is to engage students in learning with a focus on the priority standards in the four core areas while also providing wraparound supports and enrichment opportunities for our students. The student day will be structured in three blocks, a humanities um, block, social, um, which includes social studies and English, 
uh, and a STEM block, math and science, and um, we will be um, providing uh, project-based um, activities in the humanities um, and STEM blocks. Um, they will also have an enrichment block where a variety of activities will occur, including social emotional learning, uh, PE, virtual uh, field trips, uh, reading projects with the librarian, just to name a few. Um, students will also engage in uh, community building and social emotional activities throughout the week. And this will also um, be happening in both the virtual and in the um, in-person um, program. In the virtual um, platform, there will also be office hours daily for students to, to receive additional assistance because we do recognize that um, three consecutive hours um, on the computer in a Google Meet um, in the summer um, could be a little challenging. So um, we will provide that opportunity for students to get one-to-one um, -one or small group instruction through office hours. Our metrics include pre and post uh, test in both reading and math. And like the elementary program, we'll, we will use um, ARP funds totaling um, 325,000, um, just over $325,000. Uh, moving on to the high school, similar to the middle level summer program, we will offer an in-person and virtual summer school opportunity for our high school students from July 6th through, Albany, through August 11th at Albany High School. Um, students will be in person um, from 8.30 to 12.30, Monday through Thursday, which also includes breakfast and lunch. As in the past, our academy assistant principals are coordinating summer school uh, with the support from our principal, Ms. Comerford, and also um, through my assistants. There will be over 80 staff supporting our students in grades 9 through 12, uh, two of which are social workers to support the social emotional needs of our high school students. Um, Summer school will include a blended approach between Apex and Google Classroom for virtual instruction, as well as synchronous and asynchronous learning in a Google Meet. The majority of the courses offered uh, will be for credit recovery, including living environment, or science, English, algebra, and uh, US history uh, or global history, depending on student need. Um, and then to measure the effectiveness and impact of summer school, uh, we will continue to use attendance and credits recovered for coursework an advancement to the next grade, and of course, our graduation um, rate for August. Again, like our elementary and middle level, um, the traditional summer school for high school um, is approximately $525,000 um, and allocated using our ARP um, funding source. Uh, I'm super excited um, to talk about the next slide, um, which is, uh, high school courses uh, for first time credit in the summer. So continuing with um, high school, we're so excited to be offering a variety of courses for the first time. Um, per the New York State regulations, students must receive the equivalent of 90 hours of instruction in the summer for a one out one credit course, one credit class, and the equivalent of 45 hours of instruction for a half uh, credit class. So in um, thinking about um, first time uh, courses, first time credit courses for credit, we looked at a variety of classes, including AB, AP, IB, and UHS courses for the summer. And unfortunately, IB and AP courses can't be offered for first time credit during the summer. However, we can offer um, UHS um, courses. So in our planning with district and building leaders, as well as our school counselors at Albany High School, we identified a variety of subject areas and interest that would allow students the opportunity to take classes in the summer and ultimately open up a space in a student's schedule in the upcoming year or years for uh, other courses of interest. And so as you can see um, in this list, um, we will be offering um, journalism, which is a university in the high school uh, course for one credit, forensics, Core Chemistry, Career and Financial Management, which is a half credit course, Computer Application, Health, Multicultural Studies, Studio and Art, and then Digital Audio Workstation, um, or what we use, uh, what we call DAW. Um, so those are the classes that we um, will be offering. Um, students will be expected to register for the class. Um, each course, um, um, that I just mentioned will be dependent on enrollment. 
Um, we have um, identified a minimum of 12 students uh, to run the class and a maximum of 15 if we are in person because of the social distancing. Um, and then also, um, it, it is also dependent on a teacher interested in teaching um, those courses that I just mentioned. Our supervisors uh, did reach out to teachers um, to poll interest, and we um, um, have identified teachers who are interested in the courses that I've just mentioned. Um, students um, taking first time um, classes for first uh, first time credit will receive a numeric grade for the course and the grade will appear on a student's trans transcript. If a student is not experiencing success in class, um, they will have an opportunity to drop the course through July 16th, which is approximately the halfway mark of the um, marking period. Um, these courses are similar to college classes where a half year or full year curriculum is condensed into 40 or 90 hours. So there is a high level of commitment on the student's part and participation and commitment is key to success. Um, so we're super excited about that and um, we will continue to um, work through that and develop a communication plan um, with the communications office and the registration process, um, et cetera. So this is um, just recently developed. So there's more work to be done. Um, the next, um, on the next slide, our newcomer program. Um, last year, we did not offer this. It was um, embedded into our elementary, uh, middle and high school um, virtual um, summer school program. So um, we are excited to um, have our newcomer program back in person. Um, we will focus on students uh, who are who are our potential incoming AIC students in grades six through 12. The program will be located at um, Edmund J. O'Neill at 50 North Lark Street from July 6th through August 6th, Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 11.30. So um, very similar to our um, middle school program. Um, the newcomer program will offer a combination of social and social emotional learning as well as academic and civic lessons designed for our newcomer students in the program. We will have on-site translation services available throughout the program as well. Um, and our goal for the program is um, identifying and addressing unfinished learning due to the pandemic, while also providing social emotional supports, building foundational and background knowledge that will accelerate their success as they approach the new school year as well as gaining basic literacy skills and an understanding of local and civics for um, academic understanding. Um, the uh, uh, determining the impact of the program will be through several data points, including attendance, survey data, and the newcomer, in, newcomer inventory assessment. The total cost of the program is um, um, nearly $77,000, and we will be using both Title III funds and ARP funds to support um, this program. Our last and final um, summer program uh, for tonight's discussion and presentation is our extended school year program for our uh, students with disabilities. Students with disabilities. Um, this program um, will offer an in-person and virtual option uh, for our students with disabilities who have extended school year on their IEP. Our in-person ESY program will be located at Eagle Point Elementary School. Um, and for both virtual and in person, uh, the program will begin on July 6th and run through August 16th. This day starts at 8:30 and ends at 12:30 for our um, in-person kiddos, and virtual uh, and breakfast and lunch will be provided. Um, the purpose of extended school year for students with disabilities who qualify um, is to address regression in um, academics, social and behavioral functioning, communication skills or other skills um, identified on a student's individual um, education program um, plan. Um, and again, like I said, the eligibility for this uh, ESY programming is based on the individual student regression and recruitment data and is determined by the CSE. Um, progress monitoring data in reading, math, as well as related service, services data based on students' IEP will, IEP will be collected throughout the program to determine the impact um, of ESY for each indi individual student. The structure for students participating in person um, is a little bit different from our virtual, um, so I'll explain both. 
Um, for in-person, um, we will structure it into 90-minute blocks for ELA and math instruction. The teacher and teaching assistants will provide individual and small group instruction. Um, related service providers will provide speech therapy, social work, occupational therapy, and physical therapy according to the student's IP. So it'll be broken up into those blocks. Um, for students participating in a virtual um, extended school year program, their day will be structured in a two hour block, 30 minutes in a Google Meet where they will be, uh, where there will be spe specially designed um, whole group instruction, interact using interactive platforms such as Flipgrid and uh, Nearpod, and you've heard us talk about those throughout the school year as we've um, increased our um, instructional practices in a virtual environment. Um, and our virtual uh, program will also offer social emotional support using second step. In addition to this um, 30 minute of uh, specially designed um, whole group instruction, um, we will also have a 90 minute small group and individual meets um, time focusing on ELA math and writing skills, uh, reteaching and skill reinforcement support and a variety of blended, lear blended learning lessons for unique learning through Lexia, Dreambox, and Raz Kids. Um, again, for our virtual kiddos, progress monitoring of IEP goals will also occur. Um, and this was similar to last year, but I do want to note that given the challenges with COVID-19, we will also offer continuity of related service programming this summer. Uh, this service is provided to students who do not qualify for ESY, um, but need additional related service um, continuity and access in the areas of speech and language, occupational therapy and social work. And students who um, students will be um, individually identified as candidates for the service based on a rubric um, developed for each of those areas that I mentioned. The total budget for um, ESY is approximately $535,000, of which 80% is reimbursable by the New York State Education Department and the remaining 20% is through the general fund. So that was the end of our summer school programs. I would now um, like to open it up for questions and comments. Thank you very much. It's always a very uh, interesting um, presentation and there's so many different programs um, and they're all slightly different. I know because I can read minds that the um, new component at Albany High is going to generate a lot of interest and enthusiasm and questions. So I think we should just start there and get those questions out and then we can go back and see if there's questions on the other programs. And I can tell Ms. Smith is jumping out of her skin. So we're going to go to Ms. Smith on the Albany High um, new programming. Now, President Savage, first, I really have to say, I was thrilled about reading this entire, you know, plethora of summer programming. I think this is exciting. It sounds, um, you know, like very engaging. It, there's just so much here. I was just thrilled walking. I was walking, you know, standing up, reading this last night, walking through the house, and I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then, of course, when I get to the high school, I just could do somersaults. I didn't, but I wanted to. And so I'm thrilled because I know that that was something that um, has been discussed before. In fact, I recall early on in conversations with Superintendent Adams when she came aboard, this was something uh, that she uh, wanted to help us initiate and get going. And so I am just delighted to hear about this opportunity for the first time credit uh, for our youngsters. And to me, all of this together, it, it just seems in my in my way of thinking, it almost changes the culture of summer school, right? All of this, it's, it's really about opportunities to continue your learning. Um, and so, super, um, Ms. Savage, I think when you talk about opportunities, whatever that phrase is that you say, this makes perfect sense to me here um, because there's an opportunity for youngsters no matter what they need, you know, for fun, for excitement, for advancement, it's here. And I really was delighted to, to see this. So I'm going to be quiet now. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you so very much, President Savage and Vice President Smith. I do want to take a moment to highlight the courses for first time credit. And I will say thank you so much to Ms. McKenna for picking up the charge and working with our staff and looking at opportunities for our students because we know that this is the time now to seize the opportunities. And while we understand and know that the summer is an opportunity for credit retrieval, we can also offer our students 
credit advancement so that they can earn those credits. And one of the things that we have heard consistently and Ms. McKenna has, and I have talked about over time, students don't have the flexibility in their schedule for other courses that they may want to take because they're locked into their required courses or they only have room for one elective or whatever the case may be. And so how do we build a pathway? So this is the question that we start with, the essential question of how do we build a pathway for those opportunities for those students who may want to move ahead in their schedule and take courses. Now, while you do not see the entire um, offering of what would be traditionally offered, we have to start somewhere and we have to start with what's available and we also have to build that program and the mere fact that we have teachers that I think are so committed to our students and we have those teachers that have been working summer school time and time again and what is it that we can do to still offer something for our teachers um, for additional opportunities for them to grow and enhance their craft and so now being able to offer those courses for students to get ahead um, presents almost that whole balance of equity because there are students that would like to take courses to get ahead. Uh, some may look to graduate early. Some may look to take, you know, two math classes or two English classes or two science classes because that's what they are interested in. Um, it also opens up areas in their schedule so that if they want to take more of the arts or music, those types of opportunities are now available as we move through. As we grow, we look that, to see this course offering grow as well, um, because hopefully uh, more of our students will take that opportunity and look at those particular courses that they can take to free up their schedule so that they can take other courses during the year so that they can move forward. So thank you very much. And Ms. McKenna, thank you so very much for picking up the charge and really moving forward in a very exciting way and just another opportunity for our students. Dr. Tutor on this topic. I love it. I really, really love it. I mean, summer school is no longer being looked at remediation. It's more for acceleration and enrichment and doing more with your time and your future when you can. Right? So like you said, you can take these courses now and add other things that you may not juggle your schedule. Logistically, I have a question in terms of, you know, our, our, our um, high school kids, some of them are also going to be in the summer youth employment programs and stuff. So are these courses also offered asynchronously that they could come in the evenings and then take those classes, submit the reports or whatever, if they, if they are motivated and enthusiastic or? Is so I'll let Ms. McKenna explain a little bit more. Um, so we're working on when the courses will be offered. We will, we do know that some will be virtual um, just because of the nature of the class. Um, but we also know that, for example, core chemistry and uh, forensics um, and the two uh, studio and art, um, for example, will be only offered in person um, from the 830 to 1230. Um, that's when our summer school runs and um, uh, staffing is a challenge um, outside of those hours, um, but certainly, you know, any course that we can offer in a virtual, an all virtual environment, we will have more flexibility on when that course um, is offered. Okay, great. And, and the sooner that information becomes available, the students before they take on their summer youth employment opportunities, they can plan better too. But I love it. I love the idea. Thank you so much for all the effort towards making this happen. Thank you. You're welcome. Board member Amanyawi. This is super exciting. As Vice President Smith said, um, I really am impressed by the courses. Um, and it, I did a little bit of quick math. And if, if I'm not mistaken, in person, this would potentially allow 135 students to take additional credits over the summer because there's nine courses. Um, 15 students max each, uh, 135. So um, I want to encourage our community and our uh, parents and guardians to really look into this and our students to make the most of this. 
Thank you. Actually, that if you don't mind, that's a segue to something I was going to ask, which was, um, are you planning, because this is a totally new program, um, and a school messenger home to parents? Um, I assumed you would. Um, and in particular, I wanted to tie that into a compliment to the guidance department. Um, I know I had a parent tell me that they were they got a chance to sit with the guidance department as they talked with their student about um, college opportunities and that there was some sort of video about how that works that they showed to the student. And they said that the video was exceptionally high quality, that the experience was really great. And they encouraged that to be shared with all parents because most parents don't participate in those guidance meetings. This was a particular situation. So um, I was just thinking, you know, all the things that the guidance folks are doing because the high schoolers are so independent, you know, they have that inter that specific relationship with the guidance counselors. But when we can share these kinds of things with parents, um, we parents can have an influence on um, on choices that kids are making still. Yeah. So one of our next steps is to work with our communications division um, to uh, communicate it out um, to our families and our students. And then also internally at the building level, um, uh, work with and identify students who um, could potentially take advantage of these courses as well. And I do want to make note that um, for our in-person, our maximum enrollment would be 15 because of social distancing. Um, however, in the virtual environment, we would increase that to 25. And if you had enough student interest, you could potentially recruit a second teacher to do a second section, right? I mean, if you got 30 kids who wanted to do core chemistry, I don't know that that's a realistic example, but you could p try and recruit a second teacher and do multiple sections as well. And as always, we wanted to make sure that we shared it here first before we do the media blitz uh, moving forward. But we are very excited, so thank you. We appreciate that. Board Member Mann. I wonder if we would have a, I know that we have families that move to Albany because of our pre-K program. And I wonder if we would see um, students from other districts want to take courses or maybe more families move to Albany to take because of these opportunities. It's a comment. And if that did happen, would they uh, be able to pay tuition? So you mean while they are enrolled in another district, they would come here for their courses? For summer, for the, for the for summer, summer advancement, for, the summer. for summer credit earning. I don't know how that works. We'd have to look into that um, because I do know that there is a tuition component, but I'm not sure that we would be able to do that. I, I don't know, so I will absolutely look into that, but I'm not sure about that. Now, I will tell you that our uh, at the secondary level, we typically are at capacity and don't have the ability to open it up. Okay, any other comments? Oh, Ms. Smith, I'm sorry, I forgot about you. Um, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on Dr. Shador's question. Um, in in the past, uh, pre-COVID and prior to this one-time credit courses um, development, we've always had students who are involved in the city's uh, workforce program, right? And so, is there um, is there a I don't want to say workaround? Is there a uh, MOU or, con or collaboration of some sort with them? Okay. So it's not an MOU, but it's just within the process that um, we work with summer youth employment uh, so that there, there's no conflict with the students who are going to summer school as well as summer youth employment. There's no conflict. We work okay. with the city and, on and that. And that's, so that really does answer your question, I mm -hmm. think. And I, I just wanted to make sure because that's what I was understanding. So whether you're in a, you know, three hour program a day Doesn't or whether matter. you're taking the one time credit course, you're, we're going to work with you and accommodate. It, exactly. Okay. We work with summer youth employment. There's Excellent. there's not a conflict with students who need to attend summer school. Board member Elminiam. Are we switching topics or can we? I was actually going to invite conversation on any topic since I think we've done pretty much what we wanted to talk about about Albany High. So go ahead, whatever it's on your mind. Two questions. Uh, so breakfast and lunch provided every site. Is that also for students that are not in the uh, summer school program? That's the first question. Um, I think the answer is yes, but I might be mistaken. And then uh, I just want to clarify transportation provided for elementary sites and that's 
regardless of 1.5 miles or or not? Yes. Dr. Wilson Turner. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, to answer your first question, uh, typically in the summer, we offer food summer sites open to anyone in the community who needs a, a breakfast or a lunch. Um, and we use our program sites for that through um, the, you know, the work of Lisa Finkenbeiner and her, her folks. And then um, <clears throat> transportation. Every year we provide transportation to any student who wants to participate in the summer program, regardless of mileage, because we use neighborhood um, pick up and drop off spots. And so if they can get to a spot that's convenient for them, they can get on a bus and find their way to the program. And we do that primarily because we don't offer a summer school program in every bu school building for elementary students. We only have three sites and we want to make sure everyone can access it. Thank you very much. Ms. Wilson. Thank you. I was agreeing with everyone um, initially about this was an excellent read and appreciating that we incorporated college and career readiness into this summer initiative. Um, I don't have a question. I was more so sharing praise as well. Anyone else with comments or questions anywhere throughout the presentation? Board Member Creighton. Well, at this point, I'm just echoing the positive comments of my colleagues, uh, but this is really the summer program is at the high school level. Uh, allowing first time courses really, really does build that culture of of academic learning for learning's sake and just build builds that level of excellence and lets kids accelerate and get gets those credits out of the way. So it's really just a sea change and it's fantastic. So thank you. And then my my only other question was on some of the other programs and it's more of a general question. Unfortunately I know these are each specific program, but if a, if a, it I believe at the elementary and middle level, the children for the most part have to be invited to participate based on the criteria. I think at elementary, it's like approaching grade level and at second or at the middle school, it's like, you know, you, you're behind and you need to catch up in order to move on to high school. But if a parent felt that their child was really in need of this additional academic support, is there capacity for um, parent request at either of those levels or are we really... Um, maxed out on capacity on at those levels so at the elementary level um this year we're trying a slightly different approach um, we have opened our um, application process actually i think we went live yesterday um, to all families with the qualification that we have limited seats but we want to assess families interest in having extended learning opportunities in enrichment in the summer and then schools will work with their individual populations to ensure that the students who um, we typically prioritize as you said are, are um, high high growth but low achievement students um, and this year in particular are um, low achievement and poor tenant students being a real focus for us and getting them in in person but if there are spaces available for other students who would attend regularly and benefit from summer school. Um, we're trying to be more flexible in that with the number of seats that we have. And that 630 number is still at that six feet social distancing um, uh, staging. And so if we have the capacity to increase that even slightly to um, to offer seats to more families because there is an interest, we, we just see that there is an importance to anyone who is willing to get extended summer learning um, and, and enrichment to be able to have that. I understand, thank you, that's very helpful. Okay, anyone else questions on summer school? Otherwise, we will be excitedly looking forward to a report on the success of summer school um, in a few months. That brings us to the end of our discussion agenda and we return to our normal um, topics of committee reports. Anybody have committee reports to report on? No committee reports. It's been two whole weeks since we had a board meeting. Come on, beeps. All right, no committee reports tonight. Um, and then any items of other business? Board member man. I wanted I wanted to um, uh, recognize Dr. Uh, Wilson Turner. I um, opened my newspaper today and saw that uh, she is one of the commencement speakers for the College of St. Rose. And so I'd like to just say congratulations. Thank you very much. Any other items of other business? Board uh, Superintendent Adams, <laughs> or you can join us here, board <laughs> member you. Superintendent Adams. Uh, so at this time, during routine consent, we did have um, a principal that we have reassigned and we wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that principal. We are happy to announce that Rachel Stead will go over to the Albany International Center as the principal. 
So congratulations, Rachel. We are so proud of the work that you've done and the work that you continue to do for our district. So thank you. You're here. On that note, I would entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting and motion by Ms. Smith, second by Dr. Chatur. All in favor. And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Have a good night. We'll see you in two.